right? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. So, yeah, uh, apologies. Really, I, I I really want to be there, but unfortunately, I was, uh, as Alex mentioned, I was not, uh, yeah, well. So, yeah, I prefer you know to be uh, present in this period, you know, of, <laughs> of pandemic. I don't come to infect anyone. Um, anyway, it's uh, yeah, it's a really great pleasure. I I follow yesterday with uh, with great interest. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people sharing uh, uh, sharing different point of view about the fish base and the use of, da of data to um, influence uh, you know intervention investments and uh, uh, research and uh, and policies and you know to to help to help the world to transition toward. Uh, something possibly better, and in part, it's uh, it's what we wanted to do with uh, this new initiative, uh, which is basically uh, led by uh, Warfish, and uh, you know, it's it's about resilient aquatic food systems uh, for uh, healthy people and planet. And uh, um, uh, the idea is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of stakeholders participated to uh, the, um, you know, a sort of co-development process of this uh, uh, of this initiative, with the idea of uh, uh, looking into really the um, the needs of uh, food system transformation, in particular in relation to aquatic foods. And food system, food system transformation in terms of, uh, uh, of course, uh, the idea of sustainability, the idea of inclusion, the idea of uh, um, of sustainability in in in, in, re in really in an overarching uh, uh, framework. And uh, uh, you know, it was very clear every time we uh, we approached the discussion that at the center of uh, of, of most of it there are there is uh, uh, the need of having clear knowledge, information, clear data. And so, you know, many, many times, uh, um, uh, you know, the um, reference to uh, fish base and uh, to the need of, uh, of data, of sharing also data and information was, uh, was quite, uh, quite compelling. Um, anyway, why an initiative on aquatic foods? Well, uh, absolutely the uh, you know there are uh, many many reasons, but uh, the fact is uh, that uh, uh, you know the uh, aquatic foods provide. Uh, and as I, I think yesterday, many or many of you mentioned, you know, in particular fish micronutrient rich foods for a lot of people, 3.3 billion people. I mean, here we summarize a lot of figures. I really don't want to, to start reading it, but the important part is, uh, you know, the aquatic foods are nutritionally important, support uh, millions of households, and uh, uh, many of them are, uh, you know, uh, the landless poor among, uh, you know, uh, um, different, uh, different uh, um, um, you know, groups of, uh, of population. And uh, um, it, it's clear that aquatic food system are um, very deeply connected with, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the uh, food, land, and water system. And we need definitely to look at uh, a good governance and adequate levels of investment in order to unlock the potential of aquatic foods and ensuring that it's um, the transformation, the transition towards something that is more sustainable is helping to uh, rebalance the um, um, inequalities in our society, but also helping the, uh, the most to uh, meet their, their needs in terms of diets, in terms of uh, livelihoods and such. And, uh, um, but not just, just this, you know, we are also looking at uh, uh, the value that aquatic food systems have for uh, um, uh, producing food at uh, low carbon cost and, uh, you know, with many synergies with biodiversity and ecosystem conservation. So, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of reasons why we believe, uh, you know, aquatic foods are at the center of the discussion and they are not marginal. But at the same time, um, we also recognize that uh, there are a lot of challenges. Um, uh, challenges uh, mostly related to the fact that there is uh, um, an, under, an under investment uh, level in, uh, in, uh, in aquatic food systems. And, uh, you know, it's clear that co compare, sorry, because it's important to say when we, we mention about under investment compared to something, but to, to simple to the terrestrial, um, to the terrestrial um, uh, systems, and uh, um, 
And however, you know, um, it's clear that, uh, you know, despite there are a lot of challenges, there is uh, a lot of potential, a lot of potential that, uh, um, you know, needs to be uh, unlocked. And that's why we believe, you know, this initiative, this program focused on aquatic foods, uh, you know, was, was particularly relevant. And uh, one of the um, you know, um, among the different challenges that I probably already already in part mentioned, clearly there is uh, um, there is the the, the issue of uh, aquatic foods, uh, uh, wild aquatic food stocks, uh, the inequities in supply chain, uh, inequitable aquaculture pr uh, productivity growth, uh, vulnerabilities to climate change, uh, pollutions, aquatic animal disease, and antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance, and also recently, you know, something more actual like. Uh, disruption due to uh, pandemic or, or to different risks, also of natural hazards and you know also political economic st economic stability instabilities. Uh, however, you know uh, how we can uh, in a way help to uh, mitigate and uh, uh, try to address these uh, these challenges is a uh, true. Um, um, different action and uh, um, you know one of the key of uh, among this action is, uh, is is definitely the fact that uh, um, you know we need to address the the, the lack of data um, lack of data to inform policy and investment decision making leads to uh, to them being uh, um, you know uh, listening and, and and taking action and uh, um, and uh, this is this is for us is um, definitely uh, absolutely you know one of the of the key point and uh, and uh, you know it's it, we really believe that uh, uh, aquatic food system transformation pass through better data and, uh, and not only better data but also uh, the way that those data are, are made available you know because the fact uh, it's not just it's just just having the data but the fact that this data reach the right people you know and the right uh, uh, stakeholder groups probably and uh, mm, so how we structure our um, our initiative we structure our initiative among uh, uh, five work packages or um, you know uh, yeah five, five work packages and uh, um, you know the first one that i will give you a little bit more uh, uh, more insight is uh, is aquadata and the fact that it's the first one is uh, should immediately uh, tell you that the value that we we, we give to data and uh, the value that we give to uh, the way data are produced and uh, you know the way are the, the the way the data are analyzed the tool that is used to analyze the data and also how data can support uh, uh, you know the way how, how data can support aquatic food system policy and investments and uh, uh, then and we have a second work package which is about partners uh, aqua and partners so the you know after the data we believe also that uh, um, the realization of food system transformation has to pass through um, um, alliances and uh, and the strategic uh, uh, partnership uh, you know that are the way to, un to unlock also the potential of the food the aquatic food system transformation in different geographies um, then we have, uh, um, you know, work package three that is aqua plants and uh, is very much uh, about aquatic food in multifunctional water management plants. Then we have aqua genetics, you know, um, where fish has a strong program and strong action around uh, um, uh, working to scale uh, delivery of, uh, of genetically improved fish varieties, in particular around uh, uh, tilapia and carp. And uh, uh, also we have uh, the last work package about Hapa Labs that is, uh, is everything around, uh, um, you know, establishing platform for scaling innovations in, uh, in specific uh, context and uh, doing, doing it, you know, to ac also accelerate uh, um, and catalyze attention and investment around uh, ideas and, uh, and um, you know, that are, are, are very contextual to specific, uh, to sp to specific geographies. And, uh, um, you know, these, these work packages basically they really want to achieve outcomes at the end. Um, outcomes are, um, outcomes are, of course, uh, are related to uh, the idea of, uh, of um, overarching Im impacts that are, you know, around the food and nutrition security, they're around uh, uh, gender empowerment and equalities, they are around uh, um, uh, inclusion, then they are around uh, um, 
um, poverty reduction. They are they are around uh, uh, climate change and uh, and, uh, uh, and and environmental uh, environmental impacts. So, however, you know we are despite there is a long term vision that is relation in relation to these impact areas you know we, we really believe that uh, in in the three years of implementation of this initiative we can achieve some outcomes that are you know much earlier than this uh, overarching impact and the idea is to uh, you know among different uh, um, uh, different out outcomes to achieve is to uh, uh, support uh, uh, basic scaling partners stakeholders in in the geography where are we are implementing the initiative i will i will i will uh, show you where exactly but uh, um, you know in in 11 countries to use improved knowledge system and data to inform at least five evidence-based investments supporting aquatic food system transformation so the idea really of you know yes producing data but making the states available uh, to different stakeholder based on their needs in order to um, you know, um, helping them to produce something that is unlocking the, pot the potential aquatic foods for uh, real, uh, um, uh, real change in the society. And uh, um, then, of course, we have aquatic food system labs uh, developed in Solomon, Bangladesh, and Zambia. Uh, we have improved management of production, sustainable development pathways to secure rights and livelihoods benefit for small, uh, small scale actors. Uh, in aquatic food system in Asia Pacific, and also bring more nutritious diets, gender transformation strategies, and at least uh, um, you know uh, develop new um, uh, and improve strains of uh, carp, catfish, etc., to increase productivity, but also to decrease environmental environmental effect, particularly in Bangladesh, uh, India, and Nigeria. So all these work packages work together to achieve these in th in three in three years, which is. You know, quite uh, um, quite ambitious, but we believe we believe uh, we believe this. We have to be ambitious, you know, to um, to achieve to achieve real real change in the society. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, where we work, you know, uh, sorry, I, I probably I should have uh, showed this uh, earlier on, but you know, the idea is to work with the various work packages in these different geographies. Um, uh, there are these 11 countries, you know, uh, split between uh, Asia, the Pacific, uh, and uh, and Africa, and uh, mm, you know, and uh, and we believe that all together these work packages and synergies with partners and uh, you know can help to to move forward uh, in uh, in really achieving the, the you know aquatic food system transformation. Uh, our said that I, I I really want to uh, you know come back more on the on the uh, discussion that is uh, um, probably more interesting for for the audience and um, of this symposium that is about you know the first work package so aqua data and uh, uh, you know during the discussion during the the work around the development of uh, the aquatic food initiative um it was one one point that i believe every stakeholder agree on so we have this consultation we have you know a lot of uh, participation in the in the elaboration of the of the aquatic food initiative and uh, you know anybody uh, highlighted that uh, there is a lack of robust and coherent data uh, about aquatic food systems. And this is a, basically a fundamental barrier to realizing the aquatic food system transformation and uh, to, 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 to produce impacts, basically, not through the aquatic food system transformation. And uh, you know, this is evident in uh, not not only in the, in the lack of statistics, but uh, is is more than that. Is uh, despite sometimes the data even even are available, but they are it's very difficult there. There, there is a challenge, is a barrier in, in 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 reaching the right people and making those data available for for them to be used to take to to, to be informed and take decisions. Um, so, in summary, Aquadata intends to uh, then work around three main. Uh, um, you know, wants to achieve three main things. And uh, so uh, wants to synthesize existing data and produce new data to support equitable evidence-based decision and investment, produce benchmarking data, structure aquatic food system monitoring and evaluation real time, and improve evidence informing decision and action by farmers and fisher, private sector and policymakers. 
the way they want to do this is of course producing uh, um, data and uh, and um, an ecosystem of uh, of data that is uh, is uh, is fair so it's fundable accessible interoperable reusable so basically all open access and uh, uh, the idea is uh, to start thinking about key indicators that may be uh, easy to be understood by uh, by many and uh, because one of the uh, also other element that uh, that came out that uh, sometimes also despite data are available the information are um, too many or too much and uh, and uh, um, and difficult to be to be read by um, by the different stakeholders so there is no need to give all the information to everyone in a way um, so um, how we want to do that is basically uh, in three in three ways. So the first different three, three, three different pathways of, of work. And the first one is identifying data gaps in aquatic food systems. Um, so there is a, there is clarity uh, that uh, um, you know data gaps uh, are very context specific and stakeholder specific, and uh, uh, you know there's need of uh, uh, understanding the uh, the gaps in terms of availability of data, in terms of quality of data, in terms of availability, sorry, in terms of usability of public data according to the various sector of what food systems. Um, the second is uh, a new and derived data for aquatic food systems. So the idea is uh, it's a little bit, um, I, I, I think, very synergic with uh, with what fish uh, fish base is doing. That is uh, the idea of uh, you know uh, looking at what is there and assembling and unifying existing data set from available resources and making it available, um, you know, um, responding to the different needs of the various stakeholders. You know. And um, and also looking in that uh, when we when we say that we look at all the um, um, the, 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 the data management cycle that is not just uh, um, you know uh, about uh, producing data but ensuring that those data are responding to key dimensions and uh, uh, like uh, you know are gender sensitive uh, are collected using uh, um, you know uh, clear and robust and coherent uh, um, monitoring uh, so, sorry protocols and uh, and uh, you know they are helping you know to uh, basically uh, creating a sort of uh, um, aquatic food systems that database or where you know there are specific uh, indexes that can help to read into into it and, uh, and finally, the third part is, uh, is uh, how once we produce the data, how these data are, are helping to inform decision and policies on aquatic food systems. You know, and uh, it's clear that uh, um, it's not just making data available, but uh, you know, it's it, we are very much, uh, um, very much, uh, um, I would say. Uh, focus on the fact that data are uh, data and the way data are collected and stored, etc., are, are very much is very much inclusive, you know, because we feel sometimes this um, digital transformation that we are assisting. So the way they are, you know, we are producing data sometimes is, is tend to be excluding, not not creating this inclusion, but uh, you know, uh, uh, exclude some of the group that find to uh, be difficult, especially especially most small holders, you know, to participate and to be informed. And uh, um, so, said that, um, I try to pull together a little bit of, uh, of uh, ideas on, uh, on the interest and, and the benefit that uh, um, we, have, uh, we have observed through this symposium, symposium of course, but also uh, from fish base. So, and the idea is, uh, uh, you know, um, somehow uh, a, a strong reflection about uh, address data management. So, they, I mean, what, what are the data we really want to collect? Um, the data for whom and uh, how we want to do it. Uh, so these are our are three, uh, three main questions that I believe are extremely relevant. Um, I think another, another, another point of reflection that came out also from yesterday is meeting the data needs. Um, so I, I remember yesterday the um, even our our DG uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Sam, you know, pointed out uh, uh, you know the diversification 
of the various stakeholders and the various needs in terms of data and how this can it can differently influence uh, policy and uh, policy um, policy development and, and investments and you know the fact that uh, um, you know the, 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 the meeting really the, the needs of the different group of stakeholders the different geography is in my opinion particularly relevant um, and and you know it's, it's helping also to um, uh, balance you know the voices of the various actors uh, uh, within the arena of aquatic food system transformation and uh, is creating really sustainability of uh, of the aquatic food system in a, in in a, in your overarching sense so not only in terms of uh, environment economics um, but also in terms of social inclusion um i was part, i was really amazed by um by the uh, the presentation yesterday of, of the inclusion of some of the key um impact dimension like nutrition um nutrition information in uh, into into data sets so the idea of uh, uh, looking at not just producing data but how these data are influencing impacts or are you know li linked to some framework that help us to look uh, into impacts so nutrition and food security um probably uh, uh, gender um gender and uh, and also uh, you know information about climate um so th this is of course pose us questions and and the way data are collected, but they, the way data are managed, and the way uh, you know we are going to present the data. Uh, so it's uh, it's very much uh, very much interesting, and I believe is is something we have to start reflecting on. And I see a lot of synergies here. And finally, um, I believe that was also a, a point of yesterday's discussion. But uh, I want to give more voice is about the sustainable sustainable data ecosystem. Because um, it's not just producing data, it's not just producing indexes, it's not just producing, making available data, but it's, it's ensuring that those data are, are there within the time. And so there is a data ecosystem that catalyze attention, investments of different stakeholders and recognize the value. Because everyone, everyone says, uh, yes, data are important, but you know, data uh, to, 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 be, to be available requires, requires investment, requires money and efforts you know and this is uh, this is important and uh, you know i believe it's uh, it's also something that uh, uh, you know we, we really we really want to uh, capitalize and uh, on on the experience of fish base and you know and try to uh, to make this uh, more and more compelling in future um so that's that's for me yeah uh, i don't know if you uh, have any question or yeah i mean i'm happy to respond Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cristiano. Is this one working? Hello. Maybe not. Thanks, Cristiano. That was great. I think we've got time for, for one question, if, if there is one. I just wondered if you could expand very quickly on, on the, the key partners involved, uh, Cristiano. Yes, Alex. We, um, of course, uh, I, I believe uh, uh, Fishbase is one of, of, uh, of the partner we have in mind. But uh, um, we have many um, um, along the three different pathways. Uh, of course, we have many uh, stake different stakeholders at country level. Uh, so there are Bureau of Statistics and, uh, and the various ministry, private sector, uh, but also the uh, you know the um, you know communities because we believe really that uh, uh, data data gaps uh, sorry data needs are different uh, among these uh, these kind of stakeholders. But also we have uh, you know different private sector around the world and this this kind of private sector um, that could be Planetech or Google data etc they are um they are very much looking at the innovative way of uh, of producing data and uh, um you know benchmark benchmark data but also looking at um, so digitalization as a way to um you know looking i, I think one of the nice experiences is yours alex you know about uh, um about uh, uh, 
your your system you know of, of monitoring uh, uh, small scale fisheries um, so looking at the, the way of also looking at uh, near uh, real time data production is uh, is something that we are particularly interested but always keeping keeping an eye on uh, um, on the way we are producing data uh, that is not just uh, um, uh, you know data focus by this system focus and uh, you know the needs of uh, of, uh, of of people are at the center of this uh, so that that means uh, um, that data has to respond to uh, you know the, the real need of uh, of uh, of people in terms of inclusion, in terms of uh, um, in terms of uh, poverty reduction, in terms of all those uh, um, you know dimension, food and nutrition security, climate change, all those dimensions that are relevant for a sustainable food system transformation, aquatic food system transformation. Great. Thanks, Cristiano. I will move on to the next talk. Thanks for joining us, even if you're not feeling 100%. <laughs> okay, well said. Okay, so next up is a is a remote presentation from uh, Austin Humphreys, who is uh, based in the in the US uh, at the University of Rhode, Rhode Island, and he is going to talk to us on uh, LMAX values from Indonesia. All right, hello everyone. Um, I apologize. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I'm currently on travel myself and in a hotel room, but um, I want to talk a little bit today about um, what I've been up to the last seven or eight years in a project in Indonesia doing a collaborative data collection system. And uh, we're doing this, we've had this long term monitoring system um, primarily to update life history values for a number of species in, in Indonesia, snapper and grouper species. And um, the reason I'd like to share this with this group is. As a new consortium member, that we hope this to be. Um, I hope that my group can upload these these data and contribute them to Fishbase. And so I'm I'm giving you actually the the major results slide here first, where this is a table of the top 15 species in our data set, and the new updated LMAX values from our data collection system. And if you go and pull up a species on fish base. This is what the landing page looks like. This is for Atribuca brevis, which is actually a croaker, um, which is interesting that it, this was not in our fishery in the first few years, but then it, it popped up and is quite prevalent now. Um, but our LMAX value for over 200,000 uh, data points is 75 centimeters, which is very different from the fish base LMAX at 26 centimeters. So this is just an example of um, how our data might inform or contribute to fish base, um, generally speaking. So how did we get to that final table? Um, we started this project, or I started this project with a bunch of collaborators six or seven years ago. And um, we focused on the snapper grouper demersal fisheries that are operating between 50 and 500 meters. They're catching a lot of the large um, kind of red snapper species, grouper, um, a croaker. And uh, it's very important fishery for Indonesia, culturally, economically. Um, they're anything from tiny, small, one gross ton boats to large um, 100 GT boats and above. Uh, why don't we know much about this fishery? Well, Indonesia is a huge country, the largest ar archipelagic country. Um, it's got the second largest co coastline in the world um, behind Canada, believe it or not. There's 17,000 islands, a lot of species. So it makes monitoring for fisheries um, quite difficult. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this fishery that we're interested in um, because of its economic importance and because of the lack of data around it um, are the snapper and grouper 
or deep slope demersal fisheries. It comprises of two major gears, the long lines. These guys are fishing in less deep water between 100 and 150 meters on continental shelves. And then drop lines. These folks are generally targeting sea mounts in deeper waters from um, or up to 500 meters. And like I said, there's more than 100 species um, in this demersal fishery being caught by a range of vessel sizes. Our data collection system we um, called the Crew Operated Data Recording System, or CODRS, C-O-D-R-S. And it's pretty simple. Um, we were trying to balance simplicity with feasibility and data quality in a place like Indonesia. And, um, you know, it's, it's made up of two things, getting captains signed on to take photographs of their catch. So there's the picture on my left um, of the fish on this board where crew and captains are taking pictures of the catch right when they pull them up um, using a digital camera. And then we have vessel coordinates coming from a GPS tracker that we put on boats. Um, a lot of the boats in this fishery are not large enough for VMS or AIS trackers. So these are handheld spot tracers actually um, that we put on their boats. Um, this is a schematic or a cartoon of what the system looks like. At the top is the pre-data collection um, training and equipping captains. Uh, so we have to recruit, train, and give captains the gear. The blue square, if you follow the circle around clockwise, is the data collection part. Um, but then there's a whole back end, which you can imagine is um, a big part of the project, which is data retrieval, collecting the data from the captains, um, physically going to get the, the cameras and uh, taking off the GPS trackers and reading them, and then processing the data. And then it sort of feeds back in. Uh, the analysts on land will see certain images blurry or whatever and give feedback to the captains. Um, so further training and uh, socialization is required in this data collection system. Um, here's what our, our sites ended up looking like after, from, this is from 2015 to 2021. Um, we started with just a few and it ballooned into, oh, I don't know how many, 20, couple dozen, 20 in the high 20s or mid 20s, spread all across Indonesia. There's not equal representation, but somewhat equal um, across from uh, uh, Aceh in the western part of Indonesia, all the way across the Timor, Banda, Arafura Seas in eastern Indonesia. Um, between October 2016 and August 2020, um, we have a total of 627 vessels cooperating, comprising over 16,000 fishing trips, unique fishing trips, which yielded over three and a half million photographs or fish samples. So it's a large data set. Um, the target species, five species contributed 50% of the catch. So there's, while there's well over 100 species, the top five make up more than half of it. These, these folks are pictured right here. And of note is the first, the croaker species I mentioned, Atribuca brevis. This was not in our data set for the first few years. And then um, fishermen started really catching a lot of them in the same places they'd been fishing in years prior. So I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I wish I was at the meeting to ask folks what their ideas are about that, but um, let's see. Okay, we identified a bunch of fishing grounds so we can look at the vessel tracks and see where folks are fishing. We filter GPS coordinates based on depth and speed, much like a lot of the folks have filtered the Global Fishing Watch data. Um, you can sort of identify where boats are steaming versus fishing. With this, we published a paper um, extrapolating this with the nonlinear model um, to look at juvenile hotspots. So areas in this fishery that are catching a disproportionate amount of juvenile fishes in the thought, the thought that these are prime areas for spatial 
um, protection or marine protected areas, perhaps. And so, as you can see in Indonesia, there's a few, um, really two major hot spots. Uh, one in the Java Sea, which is the blow up here, uh, A, and one in the Suva, uh, Savu Sea. The red polygons are existing MPAs, and less than 5% of existing MPAs, um, or I think it was like 7%. Um, across across Indonesia overlapped with these juvenile hotspots. So uh, we use these data to, you know, prioritize uh, spatial planning or conservation efforts. But uh, of note or of interest here is these updated LMAX values. And, and these are important because we have verifiable photo identifications of these large species. So um, sometimes you'll see LMAX values based off of, of, you know, somewhat poor data or it's not verifiable. And a lot of these species look very, very similar to one another. So we feel that that's a big contribution here um, where we can pull up the photographs of these maximum size fish um, in the data set. So we created that table and then we used some simple conversions and calculations to take our LMAX values and calculate length at first mature or LMAT, length at maturity, L opt and L infinity. Um, the equations are there, not of super relevance here, but um, resulting in, in a lot of the sort of outputs given to managers in Indonesia look similar uh, are these length frequency distributions where we, you know, this is Lutjanus malabarcus. Pristopoides multidens, where as you can see, our sample sizes are for over 400,000 and over 300,000 individuals. We can look at the length frequency distribution in, in regard to these reference points. So L mat, L opt, L infinity, and L max. Um, I'm not going to go through these, and you know, we're less interested in. I guess for this talk, the, the actual numbers, but more of the method and how it relates to our contribution to fish base. But um, one thing of interest that we did with the length of maturity was to look at our, our values versus other published values. And those are other published values within the latitudinal range of Indonesia. These are the green dots and outside the latitudinal range to see where our LMAP values fell compared to other studies um, uh, across, the, across the world. And these are the top 15 species on the y-axis, length at maturity on the x-axis. And you can see for some of these that our study is the only study um, to derive these values. So, you know, that's obviously uh, important for uh fish base and for you know use in in models and then um you know other times other instances here are values well within the range of other published studies either outside or within the latitudinal range um, these are published in a paper this year it's the very beginning of the year um and this is my last slide which i showed you first which is kind of how we're hoping to contribute uh our data and inform the fish base database by um, adding a reference to these max length values within fish base. And some of them are very similar. Lujanus malabarcus is 94 in our data set, and I believe in fish base it's 93. Um, that's fine. Um, it's good to have multiple data sources with similar values. It's great, but some very uh, widely, attribute of brevis. Um, there were a few others uh, when I looked, but um, I think one potential study or spinoff of this might be to look at the discrepancies between the LMAX values that we have versus the fish base ones and um, see if those differences might be because of geographic differences or differences in latitudinal range of where the data were collected. Um, this work was funded by the Nature Conservancy, or we worked with the Nature Conservancy. 
Um, and it's funded by a number of projects through USAID mostly. So, um, and I'd like to thank my PhD student, Al Wibisono, who's seated here. She did um, pretty much all the heavy lifting of this project and uh, published two or three papers using the data set. Um, and she recruited captains. She installed GPS trackers. Uh, she, she's the real deal um, for her dissertation. So um, none of this would be po would have been possible without her. Um, that's it for me. And uh, I can't answer questions because it's the middle of the night by the time you guys see this for me. But um, if anyone has questions, please reach out over email. And uh, I look forward to continuing to engage with the consortium and the fish base community. Um, and I hope to see everyone soon in person. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Austin in absentia. Um, uh, as he said, he can't answer questions because he's not actually online at the moment, but reach out if you do want to follow up with him about that. Um, so next up we have, uh, Daniel, Daniel Pauli talking about um, gill oxygen limitation theory. So which has come up already a couple of times. Uh, and so now we get to hear the, the details. So, <clears throat> Hello, this work uh, goes back to, to an idea that I had in 75, when I was, uh, when I saw the first time, the, the fish uh, dropping on deck from a trawler in the Java Sea. And I saw the, the fish all dying and some of them took longer to die than others. And, um, Later, when I was looking for, for well, uh, I decided that when I returned to Germany in 76, I, I decided to work on, on the theory of the growth of fish because, because it did make sense to study each of them once at a time, the way uh, it's done in Europe uh, with cords and herring and so on. So, uh, I developed a theory that was based on gills and on, on the fact that very active fish like, like uh, mackerel and tuna die right away, whereas, uh, whereas groupers take a long time to die. And it was uh, because they have a differential consumption of oxygen. But this, uh, by way of background, the, the real reason why fish have problems in the water, and with fish, I don't only mean fish. Uh, this also applies to lobsters, to, to any animal that breathe water. Um, there is uh, very little water in, uh, in, in uh, uh, very little oxygen in, in water, about uh, 80 times less than that. And, uh, 30 times less oxygen in water than in air. The, the water is very viscose. It's very difficult to move water the way we move air. Diffusion is very slow in water, about 300,000 times slower than in air. Molecules move uh, much faster in air. And, and on top of that, there is less oxygen when you increase that is dissolved in the water when you uh, dissolve in the water when you increase temperature, and uh, that is the curve that you see, and it's almost the same for fresh water and salt water. Now, <clears throat> the opposite, however, happens with um, with oxygen requirement. So there is less oxygen in the water, and there is uh, increased oxygen requirement. Fresh. Uh, um, fish and uh, other water breathing animals need more oxygen when they are at higher temperature. And uh, everybody knows that, 
But uh, actually, the question is why? Why do fish at 15 degrees need more water, need to breathe more oxygen than at 10 degrees? And you will not actually find it in any textbook. This is not connected. Uh, everybody knows that fish need more water, more oxygen at higher temperature, but it's not. It's not why. And the reason is actually the spontaneous denaturation of protein. Uh, protein, uh, our body consists of protein, um, uh, are very function as uh, in, the, in having a certain shape, by having a certain shape. For example, hemoglobin that you see here is a protein that has in the middle of it uh, 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 iron atom, which binds with oxygen. But uh, this iron atom is, is kept in a cage that consists of, uh, of a protein. And this cage function only if, if it has the shape that you see. If it doesn't have this shape, it, will, it, it doesn't function as, as, as hemoglobin. And this shape can very, very disturb, disturb very easily. It disturbed by Brownian motion. You, you have learned that in school, Brownian motion is the spontaneous movement of molecules in water, molecules in water. And uh, this, this movement increases with temperature. In fact, temperature is increased movement of molecules. Um, and they are, the protein are, ex are exposed to more and more shocks and they fall apart. And the falling apart, the, the unfolding of a protein is called denaturation. Now, again, in the textbook, they insist, they always tell you that denaturation happens at high temperature. Uh, for example, an egg that you cook or boil becomes hard. This is denaturation of protein. But, but they don't mention to you that, it, that spontaneous denaturation happens at all temperature. And this is a reason why protein in a living body last a few hours or a few days. The they, they number declines uh, constantly and uh, each protein has a half life from a few hours to a few days to a few weeks. Put hemoglobin, for example, lasts a few days and then it has, it's spontaneously denatured because it's exposed to shocks. Now, if you increase temperature, if you increase temperature, the more protein denatured and you have to be replaced, they have to be replaced and they are replaced by synthesis. So why do you need more oxygen when the temperature increase? Because, because you need to synthesize more, more new protein, uh, which have been denatured by high temperatures. Now, for us, this problem doesn't occur because we are always at the same temperature. But uh, so we denature protein in our body at a constant rate. But a fish exposed to 25 or 15 degree between winter and summer has a completely different denaturation rate and therefore a completely different uh, metabolic rate. So this uh, evidence for this denaturation being the cause of the problem is uh, you, you find in, in the fact that denaturation occurs at high temperature, but it also occurs at very cold temperature from about four degrees centigrade to minus two, there is a denaturation increase. It's called cold denaturation. But basically, basically uh, if you have a molecule, the uh, molecules insert themselves in this uh, protein molecule, in the protein molecule, and 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 break them apart. And the colder it is, from minus from four to minus two, the colder it is, the stronger this effect is. So if if denaturation uh, causes protein to fall apart, and hence to forces increase in metabolism, it should also happen as a result of cold denaturation. And this is the case. So that is that is that sort of one problem. So that's the reason why 
all growth equations that are based on this integration of the differential equation are basically explained as uh, the, the, the growth rate is explained then as a difference between a, a process of synthesis minus a process of denaturation. And the process of synthesis, the first term after the equal sign is proportional to a function h, but also to weight to a certain power. And that certain power is lower than one. Why? Because oxygen needed for oxygen synthesis, for sorry, for the protein synthesis has to go through gills and gills cannot grow as fast as the volume. This is a surface area. I will talk about it a little bit more, but the power D is always smaller than one. It's about 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. It's always smaller than one. And the rate of denaturation, K, it can be any value, but it's proportional to weight because in a, a fish body, all protein can denature. So basically you have one term that increase with a power less than one, and another term that increased with a power of one, proportional to weight. It means that the, the last term, KWM, will always grow bigger than, than the first term, go faster. And when the two terms are equal, the fish cannot grow anymore. That's the reason why we have asymptotic growth. Basically, the second term catch up with the first term. Now. How does it translate? Well, it translates that fish must have big gills because if they, if they had small gills, they don't get enough oxygen. So they, in the course of their evolution, over millions of years, small little things with dysfunctional gills have become modern fish. A tilapia or a carp, if you open up the head, is full of gills. Or uh, not to speak of a whale shark, the, it's a bus and the head is one big gill. Important is though, that the gill surface area grows with a power of weight that is less than one. In the adults, the larvae grow very fast. The gills grow very fast and the juvenile, it, the power is more than one, but in the adults, uh, the late juvenile and uh, adult, this power is always smaller than one. Why? Because a surface to be functional has to be open, uh, the surface of the gill open to a water flow. And if it is open to water flow, it cannot be a solid. So it cannot be in a third dimension. So it has always a surface always has a lower dimension. And uh, therefore, it is always smaller than one. Then um, you can understand that uh, 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 a carp, for example, as it gets bigger, has less gills per area. And if you don't believe it, I will explain this with a car. This is uh, not a fish, and, uh, but it has in front, this is not an electric car. Eh? It has in front a radiator. Now, well, how does it work, a radiator? It gets water from the engine and uh, this water is cooled and goes back to the engine. Now, if you want to be make a bigger engine, you, you, you can make the, the radiator, oh, the, I should mention, it has lamellae, right? And the lamellae, they are exposed to air which takes the heat away, right? That's the job of a radiator. Now, if you have a bigger engine, produce more heat, you have to make it bigger, the radiator, so the engine doesn't overheat. You can make it wider, you can make it higher, but you cannot make it deeper. Because if you make it deeper, then you put a lamellae behind the lamellae and it wouldn't work because the lamellae, when it's hot, when the water is, uh, the air is hot, it, it would not take up heat, heat, function like that. 
you, there is no point putting a radiator behind a radiator. It doesn't help. And if you look at gills, that's exactly how they function. The water comes in, and when water co goes out, it has no more oxygen or very little. There's no point putting another lamellae behind it. So, so you can make it higher, can make it wider, you cannot make it deeper. So it is a surface. It remains a surface and it cannot grow as fast as volume. So basically all fish and other animals that breathe water, are, they have, the bigger they get, the less gill area and oxygen they get per unit weight. So you, you see in A that the fish gets bigger, it has less and less surface area per unit weight, and hence less and less oxygen per unit weight. And there is a point at which this is just enough to keep it going, but not to grow. In B, you see the case that the same fish is exposed now to a higher temperature. What does it mean? Well, it has higher, higher oxygen requirement. Therefore, the equilibrium where it just gets enough but no more to grow will be reached at a smaller size. So they get, they are smaller at higher temperature. And uh, I remember us writing in 2013, a big paper that had lots of attention with uh, Nemo getting smaller when the temperature is high and so on. Uh, one can explain that uh, with a model like this one, uh, where the growth rate, dw, dt, is a function of uh, a difference between synthesis and uh, denaturation. And denaturation produce uh, amino acids, which uh, can be recycled, not protein, because the protein are have been, have been falling apart, but the, they can be recycled uh, in, a, in connection with food, because amino acid, that uh, jumble of amino acid is food, actually. And you can see also in the, the, the thing called energy metabolism, that uh, there is competition between, for the fish, between activity and synthesis. I mentioned yesterday that spawning and uh, uh, producing gonad material is, is a competition, uh, it competes against growth. But, but the most of the, uh, that is perceived as con con competing against growth, but uh, most of the uh, oxygen available and uh, energy available to fish is actually used for various activities. And these activities, they compete against growth. And you can see, for example, uh, in domesticated and not domesticated fish, I should have taken a tilapia because you work on tilapia, but the, the, the quiet animals, the domesticated animal, uh, they don't eat more than the non-domesticated. They, they eat the same amount, but they are more quiet. They don't freak out every time somebody comes. In fact, they like somebody to come because they bring food. They're quiet. Wild fish uh, or wild type fish are wild and they react very strongly and they don't grow because the, the food is used for activities like moving around and which you need in reality in, 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 in the world because they are predators. Domesticated fish don't know the predators and therefore they act quiet and grow fast. This is also the reason why female fish, uh, which grow, usually grow bigger than male fish, even though they produce eggs and they produce uh, uh, gonad material in larger amount than males. They have a bigger input, uh, a productive output, but they still get bigger 
much bigger than males in 80% uh, of all species of fish. That is uh, not considered by people who say that reproduction takes away from growth. This is a fact that they cannot explain because if reproduction took away from growth, then the fish, the female would not get bigger. Anyway, another thing is this, uh, this business of being extremely sensitive to oxygen depletion is the reason why fish migrate because they cannot afford to be in hot waters um, seasonally. So some of them do not migrate, but they are, when they are exposed to big temperature changes, the price of, that they pay is remaining small. If you want to be big and there are big temperature changes in your habitat, you better, you better migrate. Because if you migrate along the West African coast, for example, uh, in A, you see that they migrate seasonally along the West African coast, and you might ask yourself why. In B, you can see why they follow the same temperature gradient. They are actually not moving with regard to temperature. They are moving with regard to geography, but not with regard to temperature. This conservatism that fish have means they cannot adapt to changing temperature. Because changing adaptation to changing temperature means thousands of, uh, of enzymes have to adjust to different temperatures, and they don't do that. Uh, it would take thousands and thousands of years of adaptation. And that's the reason why, with global warming, the fish move toward the poles, because that's where they, they don't, like people say, go to the pole where temperature is cooler, they go to the pole, the, toward the pole, to stay in the same temperature. As the temperature of the habitat increase, by shifting northward and southward, northward in the in north, northern hemisphere, southward in the southern hemisphere, they, got, they enable themselves to stay in the same temperature, the one to which they are adapted. Now, uh, a thing that I mentioned yesterday uh, that uh, really upsets me, if you look in A, you have a, a, a typical growth curve in length. And some people see, when they see such a growth curve, they see a, a two-phase phenomenon, a fast growth when they're, the fish are young, and then slow growth when they have reached maturity. And there are all kinds of theories about what happens after maturity, LM, that is the size at which maturity, and depending on the output, they would continue to grow or not. Uh, it is all fantasy. Uh, it's, these models have lots of math, lots of uh, complicated equation to work, but they are essentially based on a visual fallacy because the growth is not something that happened in length. It involves a mass. It involves weight. And if you look in B, a typical growth curve of a typical fish, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, but this, this size, uh, and you look at, at the size which correspond to the size at first maturity, the weight at first maturity is WM. You see it is extremely low. And WE is the infection point of the growth curve. That means it is the point at which growth is fastest. And you can see that uh, they spawn before, before growth is maximized. In other words, they spawn and then growth accelerates. Now, this is not an example that I chose to make a point. You will find this in fish baits, for example, for all fish, all of them do that. And it is in total contradiction to what is in the textbooks. They, they, they work in a textbook, they present you equations that are structured around the picture in A, which looks like spawning precede 
slow growth. But actually, when you look at it in terms of weight, which is the proper measure of growth, it is not so. The, they spawn before the growth is maximized. In other words, they spawn and then the growth accelerates. That has to be dealt with. And you can reproduce that very easily. Now, that is a bit difficult. If, if it is not, if spawning doesn't stop, doesn't stop the growth, then you, you have to have in fact, in any case, you must explain what triggers spawning. Because there are lots of fish that uh, will spawn at 10 years or 12 years. Well, why don't they spawn one year earlier? The explanation is usually in textbooks is that uh, the, you have stimuli, environmental stimuli, temperature or light or whatever, that triggers spawning at 10 years. Well, why does it not trigger spawning at nine years or eight years? Some element is missing. And uh, here I explain uh, the situation with my son. He, 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 at eight years, he did not notice the pretty ladies around him. And at nine, he didn't either. And uh, you, you know what I would get to. At 13, he, he, he began to, to notice them, but, but they hadn't changed. Something had changed in him. And uh, basically the trigger, the trigger is to actually begin to see the environmental stimuli. The environmental stimuli are not enough to trigger spawning. You must be internally ready. And what is it that makes, that can make you internally ready if you are a fish? Well, it's actually the prospect of not growing. If you can sense that you're beginning to be affected by the factor that will contribute to you stopping to grow or having to stop growing, if you're beginning to be affected by that, you better spawn. And if you look at A and B, that uh, I have already shown you these two things. But if you look at C now, you can see that spawning has to be before the maximum size. You have to spawn at a smaller size than your maximum size. So the maximum size corresponds to a metabolic rate. I call it Q maintenance. And the spawning size has to be a higher rate. But the ratio between the two, what is it? Well, I think, or I thought, that this ratio is going to be the same when the fish is exposed to higher temperature because it has to, it will be smaller. So it has to know to spawn earlier at a smaller size because otherwise it would wait too too much. So the ratio Q, the, the QM to Q maintenance has to be the same. It has to be constant. And that has been tested now with uh, in a multitude of studies, including one that you are editing, uh, a multitude of studies uh, uh, with tilapia. It has been tested with a uh, with um, uh, salmonid, it has been tested with 100 species of Chinese fish, and uh, the ratio is 1.35, and uh, it holds for all teleosts. Uh, it seems that for sharks and rays, the ratio is, is different. I don't know why yet, but in any case, the problem is resolved. Why fish like teleost, bony fish, why do they spawn when they do? Well, because they sense, because they're running out of breath, they're running out of oxygen, that just beginning to be out of breath, and that, that later they will not be able to grow. And that sensing is enough 
to open the, the to, for them to look, to begin to look at environmental stimuli. And the environmental stimuli from that on, from there on, are perceived. So the environmental stimuli are not sufficient. They are a sufficient condition, but they are not a necessary condition. The necessary condition is that a, a certain size must have been reached. And I'm almost done. So basically what I'm presenting here, even though it's contrary to much of what is learned in textbooks, uh, it's actually well documented in primary literature. And uh, I, I will send papers to anybody who is interested. Thank you very much. So if you have questions, I will be. Thanks, Daniel. Are there any questions, questions from the floor? Later, if you have time. <laughs> there is one um, online, Daniel. Why don't you take this one? And you can, um, uh, it says, excellent presentation. Do you think that with climate change, fish will adapt or change their gill morphology slowly? Nope. They cannot because well, there is a certain level of adaptation that fish have. They can, they can have bigger gills, slightly bigger gills. Uh, but uh, having big gills at any size is a problem because it's where osmotic exchanges take place and they expose themselves. Also, this is a place where parasites look at fish, you'll find the, the gills are usually full of parasites. So there is a price that they pay to having big gills. That's one thing. But essentially, the evolution doesn't work fast. And I mentioned uh, to increase your ability to handle temperature by one degree or two degree. That would involve mutation affecting thousands and thousands of enzymes. Because in the PIP cycle, for example, uh, you have one enzyme locked with another one, locked with another one, locked with another one, and they, and they are all have temperature optima that are adjusted. So a fish that is adapted to 25 degrees, all the enzymes are adapted to 25 degrees. So you basically, you basically do, you basically, So basically, you would have you would have to have one mutation and another one and another one it takes thousands of years. Darwinian evolution takes a long, long time, and uh, that's the reason why the the fish uh, essentially cannot adapt. They adapt to the high temperature, but going somewhere else. And if they cannot go somewhere else, they die. They will do adaptation. A little bit of epigenetic adaptation, but again, that percentage point, uh, and some of them, and that didn't, doesn't last. Thanks a lot. Uh, Eddie, there's a microphone just behind you up. Um, thank you. That was a, a really fascinating talk and a lot of physiology uh, reminders and new lessons for me. Um, is there anything that you could learn from looking at fish in fluctuating temperature environments that can't move? For example, you know, um, uh, closed basin lakes where when the temperature goes up, um, fish you know, don't have the option of, move, of moving. And also maybe um, how rock pool fish adapt to the, diurnal temperature? The, the price of adaptation to extreme environment is remain the same. Because if you are small, the surface per area per volume 
is higher. So remaining small is a trick that you can adapt, you, that extreme environment provide. Another adaptation is for whale shark people that live in the tropic, but actually they don't live only in the tropics because they spend half of their time at depth. So if they can move up and down, the, the, the up and down the water column, they actually uh, have an extreme big range of temperature that they use to maintain a, a tolerable temperature. And it is interesting with whale shark because they, they, they are only juvenile in the Red Sea and only juvenile in the, the Gulf. Uh, the adults have to be in the open Indian Ocean. Why? Because the Red Sea is not cool when you go down. Uh, it is, uh, continues to be hot. And the Gulf, the Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, uh, it, uh, it is not deeper than 30 meters. So, uh, so different, they can be only whale shark juveniles, which can handle the high temperature. But as soon as they, they reach uh, above eight, nine meters, they have to get out of there. So they, there is all kind of tricks that animals play to handle high temperature. One, another trick that they do is transform much of their body into um, jelly, which, uh, which doesn't require oxygen. And that's what mola mola, the sunfish do. And uh, every, every big fish that you see in warm water has a trick to accommodate it. Giant groupers, for example, in the tropics, what is their trick? What is doing nothing? They just sit there and they do nothing. And they couldn't do anything. If they, if they swam around, they would immediately uh, run out of, of steam. And they feed by just simply opening their mouth up all of a sudden, and sucking whatever passes by. And so, so you, when you formulate a theory like the one I do, that uh, oxygen is limiting, then people say, oh, that doesn't work for you, for this fish that animal, and I have to deal with it, and then I find a trick that they use to still do it. Thanks, Anu. Uh, yes, a uh, quick one, and then we need to proceed. It's maybe just a yes or no question. Is, is there any graph that exists with, with the gill surface and, and the body weight in which you can actually see that um, Fish that have an accessory breeding organ or lung, or like in Clarias, uh, the cauliflower organ, where they are uh, in, a, in an aberrant position? Yeah. Um, they, they are. The, the fish that can breathe air are completely, have a growth curve that is completely different from the one that breathe water. And uh, the Mekong River uh, um, catfish giant catfish uh, up to 400, 350 kilograms would never survive if it, if it did breathe oxygen uh, from air. Uh, it could never survive in hot water. And they spent most of their time actually transiting between the bottom where they are and the surface to gulp air, like Arapaima. So basically, this applies only to water breather. As soon as an animal is air breathing, this constraint disappears. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, you can uh, ask Daniel privately afterwards. And also, Daniel, there's a couple of questions on the, the chat. If you did want to answer them, you can type them in. Can I just, uh, <clears throat> sure. We can send them. So changing tack slightly um, to Latin America. And, and you're talking, Daniel, that the uh, unknown as to why sharks and rays are um, spawning at different moments. This talk is uh, about one of those rays. So this is investigating bright spots uh, for research and conservation of the large two sawfish, Pristis pristis, in the eastern tropical Pacific. This is Juliana Lopez Angarita. Slightly shorter. Hello, everyone hears me? Uh, hi, I am Juliana. I um, come from Colombia. 
Um, I'm the director of the Talking Oceans Foundation. We work in Colombia. Um, uh, thanks, Alex, for introducing me and thanks for this opportunity. So we did this, this work uh, with um, the Financial Support of Save Us Foundation and the Logistical Support of My River Foundation. Um, so why sawfish? So when you look at fish base, you will see that there is seven species listed as sawfish, five of which are valid, and all of them are uh, endangered or critically endangered at risk of extinction. Um, sawfish, as Alex says, they're raised. They have um, um, very pointed snout, 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 sorry. And it comes uh, out uh, with a big blade uh, with teeth or across both sides. Um, or as, as my three-year-old will call it, a very pointy and, and uh, prickly sword. Um, so they are, uh, they live in estuarine regions, uh, mangroves and coastal waters, and um, they're in widespread decline because of the high catchability, mainly because of the teeth get tangled in the nets of fishers, and that they are under pressure because of habitat loss, their high price in the fin trade market, and the low intrinsic rates of population increase. Uh, so my work is um, mainly uh, how many of these? My work is mainly in the critically endangered um, large, large tooth sawfish, Pristis Pristis. So, um, why in Colombia and Panama? So, um, there is very limited knowledge of the historic and contemporary distribution of, um, of these species in these two countries. And, but we know that in this Caribbean range is thought to be locally extinct already. And uh, this global sawfish conservation strategy um, highlighted Colombia and Panama as two of the high priority countries for the development of species specific national legal protection, mainly because of the availability of habitat and because of the scarcity of uh, research here. Uh, so this is also from fish base, you can see the the, probabil the, the probably, probability of distribution of sawfish um, based on suitable habitat in red. Um, so we focus, I do need this. How do I? I'm pre oh, there. So here we, we focus on this region uh, from, uh, this is the tropical eastern Pacific from uh, Mexico to Peru, but we are doing our work in the Pacific of Colombia and Panama, so right here. Um, so we're identifying potential areas of extant population of, of um, soft pristis pristis, and we will call them bright spots to those areas with the highest uh, number of sawfish encounters within 2010 and 2015. Um, so as I said, is the tropical eastern Pacific is a beautiful region, extremely culturally diverse and also biologically diverse. Is one of the um, places with highest rainfall uh, in the world. Is has amazing ecosystem, estuary lagoons, rainforests, high cliffs with pocket beaches, and mainly, most importantly, for sawfish, mangroves, and mudflats. And is um, besides a couple of really big cities like Panama City and Buenaventura in Colombia is mainly very isolated communities scattered along the coast, um, made of mestizo people, like Spanish and indigenous, Afro-descendants and indigenous peoples that rely on small-scale fisheries and small-scale agriculture and also hunting for game for survival. So how would you approach this um, research? We looked and we compiled every possible um, uh, record of sawfish in, in the region, mainly through historical records. So we went to museum collections um, to measure the specimens, email all the um, curators, and also we, we looked into online databases available. We did literature research, and we also worked to partner with the International Sawfish Encounter Dataset, who offer us all the all the possible um, occurrences they had in our area of interest, and we also um, did um, look into the, the the availability of fishery record fisheries records in these two countries, 
Uh, there's no many, but we gathered what we could so we could explore if there was any sawfish in the landing. And finally, we did uh, a lot of field work. Um, we did semi structure interviews in 38 communities, mainly in those areas where there was potential sawfish habitat. Um, so overall, we found 248 records of sawfish encounters. 71% uh, of these observations were before the year 2000. So here you can see um, uh, the reported collection year and the number of encounters. So mainly the museums and literature um, specimen, um, uh, records were pretty high in Panama because that's where all the biological expeditions um, were undertaken uh, in, the, in the 20s. And this didn't happen in Colombia because of lack of accessibility. So there were not many expeditions there. Uh, then uh, you can see our interviews in, in, in yellow. And uh, the non-interviews observations are those that um, were uh, anecdotal observations by scientists or fishers that um, provided a picture and a location. Mainly all the museum records are all stored outside Colombia and Panama. So we found that they were really good records. And, but when we went to the, to the, there were really good records outside. So in the US and in, in the UK, when we, we went to the museums in these two countries, it was pretty sad because we saw, for example, really nice individuals like these dry sawfish here but they didn't know anything about it. They just knew it was before the year 2000, but they didn't know location. So there's a lot of information missing. So for our interviews, uh, we found that most fishers, 90%, not, almost 100% of fishers knew and recognized the sawfish from the pictures that we showed. And 86% of these fishers had actually seen the fish or had caught it or had, had known someone that caught it. And of course, because it's a big thing catching one, they all went to sea. So they all had seen them. 60% um, of fishers uh, reported a decrease in the abundance of sawfish in their lifetimes. Um, we mainly um, interview fishes that were really experienced. So the mean, the mean years of experience of our fishers was like around 40 years. Um, so uh, in most locations, they said that they had not seen uh, sawfish in more than 10 years. And they reported these captures as incidental, uh, sorry, accidental. They were not targeting them. They just simply happened. And it was uh, almost troublesome for them because uh, sawfish are very strong. So once they were tangled, they couldn't retrieve the fishing gear. Sometimes they'll say they were horrified because the fish would break the boat. So, or when, when they were trying to, to, to get it untangled, it would cut them and it would really infect badly. So they were very cautious of them. Um, this is our uh, distribution, um, probability distribution map according to our sighting. Here you can see the marine protected areas in, uh, in red polygons with stripes and the dark color is the our highest probability of encounters and our bright spots that we found are in in yellow this is uh, northern chaco uh, utria national park and uh, triuga golfo de triuga and this is the darien in in panama so it was quite nice because when we were when we found this and we were writing the paper we, we received a couple of calls of people that uh, from the indigenous communities in Panama saying that they had, oh, another sawfish landed. Oh, uh, we just caught one. And then in, in, uh, in Colombia, someone saw one right here uh, while there was snorkeling and echo guide. So, uh, so those places, they are, they, they are actually there. Um, so, Overall, our results align with the widely reported global decline of sawfish. And uh, those bright spots that we found are characterized by high coverage of mangrove forests and low human population density. And this is also backed with research in our neighboring countries. Um, in Costa Rica, they found uh, sawfish, live sawfish in, um, in Terra Basierpe, uh, which is uh, the most uh, protected and like the biggest wetland um, 
in the in the country and also in Ecuador, the, they found sawfish in the most isolated places where the mangroves are really developed and and neighboring Colombia. Um, and then once caught sawfish rostrum, which you can see here, um, was kept for decorative purposes. So fishers like to keep them like as trophies, but um, like 10 years ago or more, they reported that there was a, um, a lot of people interested in coming and buying these rostrums. And then they thought it was just as a souvenir, but then once we, we, we asked more, um, we realized that what they're doing is that they get the teeth and they use them for cop fighting. So they, they put them in the, in the birds and then it's a really effective, um, a very cheeky weapon against the other bird. When, and cock fighting is really popular in these countries. And it's also happening in Panama, I'm sorry, in, in Peru. Uh, so our study confirms the distribution of the large tooth sawfish from Nicaragua to northern Peru. So that map that you saw from fish base, um, we, we ground truthed um, that potential distribution and we found that it actually we can say that it's continual. Yes, of course, it is in very specific pockets, but um, we still have to do a lot of research, especially in Colombia in the south, where we couldn't uh, ground truth because of security reasons and because of accessibility. So right now our follow-up that is happening right now is environmental DNA, uh, because it's a rapid technique to assess the presence in these places that we haven't been able to go in person and deploy our, our, our team and do interviews, et cetera. And, and just to close, um, so pushing sawfish into the national and regional uh, conservation agendas is a really important priority in, this, in these countries. But however, uh, we need to first build an understanding of the cultural and socioeconomic value of sawfish with local communities. And this is really important because they're very diverse. So you have um, Afro descendants that have their own culture, their own territories, and you have also indigenous that have their own beliefs and, and religious systems. So you cannot just do a one strategy for everything. It has to be very tailored to their specific cultural uh, backgrounds. And um, it has to be in the context of their livelihood if we want to achieve this long-term conservation uh, for this amazing, incredible um, species of, of fish that I want my children and their children to keep on seeing. So this was actually, this is a picture of the only, um, the only rostrum that we found during our, our, our field work for three years, for three years. This was the only one we found and it was in Darien, um, in Panama, in a very isolated place. You can see it's quite small. Okay. Thank you. That's all. You might have questions. So you, you, um, does anyone have any questions? I have one, um, just to put you on the spot. What, how do we follow up with this? So you're saying we need contextualized um, sort of work in communities. So how do we go about turning this into policy. So reflecting on what SM was saying, you know, that it's great research finding out about, you know, where there are potentially extant populations, but how do we go next in terms of talking to the government? So thankfully, uh, Colombia and Panama signed an agreement, um, an international agreement to protect endangered sharks. So uh, amongst those sawfish, sawfish is there. But we found that that was, few years ago, and there is no action, no further action taken in any of these communities or these places. We were basically the first ones that were talking about sawfish to them. So I think it has to be very localized. Um, and thankfully we have shown, uh, we, we, we can show the government where to focus the resources in these specific areas and just start from there. And then, but I think it has to be a process guided by the communities, because as I said, they're extremely diverse and they each have their own value system. So if we want to do something really meaningful, we start there.
and I've started uh, looking for funding to do these things. But it's a very big area. Great, thanks very much. Clara. Thank you, Juliana, really interesting presentation. I just was wondering about the younger generation of fishers, yeah. whether you talk with them and are they aware of this? Yeah, or? thanks. Yes, they, they are, but it's mainly um, via their grandfathers. Or yeah, I heard the story of my papa or my grandfather, and 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 it's just such a shame that in 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 a generation you can lose that already, right? Because you could see that it was such an interesting fish because it's intrinsically rare, so they were not catching it all the time. But when they caught it, it was like a really big thing for everybody. And, and they would keep the rostrum, like put it proudly in the house and, and everything. But then when you speak with the 20 year old fishers, they just don't have that, uh, that experience. And they just know a lot about it, but just from tales that they, they tell, but hopefully they, will, they are not just, they will not remain being tales and they can actually, hopefully the populations recover. All right, great. Thanks very much. So the um, the last session for the uh, morning, or rather the last presentation in this session, um, is from Mohammed Mashur Rahman uh, on length weight relationships uh, from here in Malaysia in Terengganu waters. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, everyone. Actually, I'm very much happy to present here because I'm also uh, feel difficulty because in front of me, many world-class top scientists like Pauli and many others present here. So this is uh, this is also feel honored me and also delighted, but also feel difficulty as well. So I am basically I am from uh, Bangladesh now doing PhD in University Malaysia Terengganu. Today I share partial data of my research, not full data, the sharing of one of the new species, newly verified species that identified in 2015. Uh, but my uh, research topics is uh, mainly project topics and our, our uh, PhD topics is population structure, reproductive biology and length weight relationship of two Lutgenus species. One is Lutgenus johnny, golden snapper, Another one is Lutjanas Jantopinis, yellow fin cinepa. So we, I, today I just shared my partial data about Lutjanas Jantopinis only from Terengganu waters. We know the appro approximately 110 species of cinepars uh, have been reported worldwide. With 10 genera, 49 of species are documented in Malaysian waters. Lut genus is a mainly a deep dwelling species which is widely distributed throughout the Indo-Pacific region. The tropical reef fish structure being steadily reduced all right. But particularly Lut genus is vulnerable to fishing pressure. Lut genus is also coral reef associated fish species uh, that uh, previously confused with Lut genus madras that are newly described as a distinct by Yatsuki at all 2015. But Lutjana is distributed through Indo West Pacific, Indian Ocean to East Indies, not to Japan. But conservation status of this species is 
that are deficient. That's also why we choose this species. Our, because there have no data in fish base till now. The length, this data, lengthed data and reproductive data as important for this management. The length addition of our reproductive biology is a fundamental topic in the study of biology and population dynamics of fishes that provide baseline information for its management. So the aim of, the, aim of this study is to describe the length frequency and length of relationship and reproductive aspects of yellowfin sinapa, Lujana gentopinis in Tiringan waters, Malaysia. We previously know that this is as, uh, confused with Lujana's madras. So we just uh, first identify this species on, basis, on the basis of uh, morphological features developed by Yatsuki et al. Then we are also confirm molecular level by CO1 gene. Then we start our sampling. Mainly we select one fish landing port in Tirangano, Pulau Kambing called. Then we have fish, uh, bring our laboratory, University Malaysia Tirangano called MST. So uh, there, here we process uh, all the data like fish size measurement, dissect the fish, sex determination, identification of gonadal stress, weight the liver and gonad. Then identification of gonadal stress based on Fakawa and Antica 2019. Here, here is five stress. Stress one is immature, mature, then uh, uh, maturing, then mature, then ripe, then spent. We are data analysis by uh, length frequency distribution with one centimeter interval by length weight relationship. We are also uh, here is analysis by length weight relationship, gonadosomotic indices, hematosomotic indices, full trans condition factors, and sex ratio, best fecundity, and everything we are analyzed. We also have a plan to analyze the length at maturity, age and maturity, also doing histology to identify the uh, gametogenic stages of this fish because we are not uh, uh, put at all because we just uh, uh, shared data only five months here. So we are uh, for gonadal um, histology, we preserve the gonad in 70% uh, 10% uh, formalin, then ethanol, then we do um, histology. Also extract the autolith for age determination. So this is the results and this, uh, of my partial data uh, of this Lugina Xanthopinis. Uh, it showed that uh, in plant unit relationship, Lugina Xanthopinis uh, shows the negative elementary growth. Two point, B value is 2.956. And 53 individuals out of 117 belongs to 17.5 to 18.5 length group. The, they are total length range 15.8 to 24.1 centimeter and weight average uh, weight between 59.9.5 to 217.7 gram. The sum of the study here just show the reproduct, uh, length weight relationship of some Lutjana species, other species. The some are positive elementary growth, some are negative, some are isometric growth. But your current study, Lutjana gentopinis, is show negative elementary growth, but near to isometric. But length weight relationship of the species might be affected by the many factors like conditions of the environment, appetite, and gonadal contents. We also um, estimate the sex ratio. 
our studied fishes sex ratio female to male is one is to one point six one. The many studies that other fruit genus species also like one point six to one, one is to one, like this. Sex ratio also vary to many species to species. It's affected by the many factors, adaptation of the population, reproductive behavior, food availability, and other environmental conditions. Now, number three is macroscopic gonad percentage of the gonad. We previously, we showed the one uh, uh, stage, five stages. Stage one is immature, then maturing, then mature, ripe, and spent. So based on this, we are identify the uh, gonadal stress. So uh, till uh, according to five month data, partial data, we just uh, maybe spawning we speak in March for the percentage of GSI, uh, percentage of ripe individuals and on the basis of GSI value. GSA value is highest in Mars. Here's uh, figure uh, 5A, so, yeah, then gradually decline. Also, compared to GSA, SA value, also GS, GSA and K value. So, here's uh, liver energy mobilization, mobilization it's in for gonad development. Some uh, summary of the spawning season based on macroscopic and gonadosomatic index and histological view. Some root genus species are spawned December to February, some are September to October, it's many parts of the world. But you know, we are uh, basically most of the root genus species are best spawners. They spawn all the year round. So we need to. Um, uh, find this species either spawn in one time in a year or two times in a year or whole the year. Need to um, uh, take, uh, wait another seven months, maybe till February 2023. This is best, we are uh, calculate here is best fecundity. The best fecundity are mostly related to the here is to estimate the 29, uh, 29 samples. Uh, fecundity range 10,803 to 43,802. But fecundity correlated to gonad mass. The mass gonad weight is high, fecundity also show high. Not related to the uh, total length and uh, body weight. Here is some st study of blood genus, fecundity of some blood genus species. So uh, uh, you know, we know that blood genus is have many species, 100 about blood 110 above 110 species, but some are very big. Because we, we select two species, blood genus journey like um, 10 kilo, but blood genus genthopinus have no data, but we, I find, uh, till 2000, uh, 270 gram only. So some are small in size, some is big. So their fecundity also vary to species to species, even size, even. This is the summary of my research. The size composition uh, male is uh, 16 to, this is present study reports the first time the late end relationship and the progress of the newly identification of our species, Lutjana genthopinis connected from Pulakombi fish landing port, Terengano. The size composition of the male female see here, length weight relationship show negative allometric, spawning season maybe start March. So need to wait the actual, uh, when then we actually, uh, the tail of uh, what the spawning season of this fish is, uh, species. And the sex ratio is 1.61 is to one, fecundity, this one. So we will also perform here, we previously we, I tell, told here, we will also perform histology for determining the uh, gametogenic stages and identify the length and maturity of this species. 
where all all in the pipeline need to wait. All result based on partial data need to sampling another seven months then got actual result. We are acknowledged, we are thankful to Ministry of Higher Education, Malaysia funding this research. We are also thankful to University of Malaysia, Terengano, Faculty of Fisheries, Science, Faculty of Fisheries and Food Science, the providing logistic and financial support. We are also thankful to my supervisors who are guide me. Also thankful to Wallfish who are give me opportunity to opportunity to presence here in my partial data thanks thank you thanks mohammed uh, yes jessica first of all thank you for a very interesting talk and i always get super excited when i see a new species for which we haven't um, got the basic data that we need and I just checked our Australian tropical database and we have never seen one of those. So my question to you is it's an awfully small snapper. Do you think that the maximum sizes that you're seeing are because it is just a really small snapper? Or do you think there has been sufficient fishing pressure on it that we're only seeing that smaller subset? Thank you. I Actually, I don't understand your question, please. You know, when you don't understand the question, it's usually because the questioner has said it really badly. Just saying. So my question is, do you think that the very small size of your snapper is because the species is just a very small snapper? Or do you think that it is fished enough that we've already lost the big ones to fishing? I don't know. Okay, we'll have a chat about it. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps I can uh, attempt to rephrase. Is there is there much? Is there a lot of fishing pressure on the species? But uh, uh, I told it's a lutgenid species, not maybe this species. I don't know. Oh, Only lutgenid species. Lutgenid genthogenis also belongs to lutgenid species. So lutgenid uh, species is. Uh, like Lieutenant Gentleman is also. Just stand a bit closer to the microphone, if you can. Oh. We just uh, share one information. And Palla and Soto is one paper, the reproductive biology of Lutgenas Vita. So, this Lutgenas Vita is not a big one, it's a small one. They show, they give information, it's a paper. They, all the Lutgenis are. Uh, uh, are uh, decline due to fishing pressure because uh, all the lutgenous species may be coral reef associated they are live together they may be when the uh, uh, fishermen catch the fish then uh, trawling the fish they may be also uh, i may uh, also snappers have uh, uh, demand as a food you know uh, in uh, the price also high, like uh, in Terengano, uh, you can load Jana Johnny, you can call locally call, you can Jinahak, this face up to 40 ringgit per kilo. So today we are also go to market in uh, but um, buy and Baru for my sampling. I come here for present here some data and also for sampling. So, so I go just also go to Bain Baru market and after Subu, then we uh, also face uh, Lurjana Johnny price is high, like 30 to 40 ringgit. So, so price high, consumer demand high, so maybe pressure, fishing pressure also may be high. Thank you. Yep. I have a small question. So you have mentioned that uh, Fox1 gene you have uh, amplified, CO1 gene. Hmm. You have amplified yes. to confirm it is a new species. Yes. No, to identify that species, not so new species. whether it is a new species or simple for identification. Have you? Uh, this is new species according to Yatsuki at all, not me. This okay. is the new species because 
previously that species is confused with Ludjanus madras. So, so this species first identified in 2015 by Yatsuki at all. Uh, Dr. Then Yatsuki I, has Yatsuki. submitted any uh, Fox1 gene in NCBI gen bank? Uh, he, pu he published, already published one paper. Yeah. In, uh, then we, because previously confused, we are also no data in fish base. So, so we are just uh, uh, during sampling. We also uh, know that Lutgenus gentopinis have yellow line, yellow lateral line, yellow line. Lutgenus vilto uh, vita is called branch to snapper, it has a brown line. So when fresh is okay, good, but when it's uh, going to be spoiled, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, when fishermen go to uh, uh, fishing, then he come back uh, three days, four days, they pick up the fish, sometimes we not find the fresh one, so slightly changed. We need to uh, uh, we need to confirm this is Vita or this is Lurjana Jantopanis or this is Lurjana Madras or this is Lurjana Lurjana because this is quite similar. Who have experience about no, Lurjana? That's what I'm asking. When there is very similar type of species are there, then molecular taxonomy is the key to identify yes, any species. to identify. This. So that's why I'm telling whether you have got any nucleotide variations have you seen or it is exactly matching 100 percent homology with uh, no species. that's why we just check uh, more than uh, 99 percent we match with lutgena gentopinis we only check five samples thank you then okay thank you great thanks Mohammed. thank you and that takes us to coffee um which we'll all be pleased to hear just out in the lobby here um, if we can come back for 11.30, we're running slightly behind, but we should be fine because they were not packing in the talks in the afternoon. So for those online, uh, we will start again in, in half an hour. Thanks very much. So we're going online for our first presentation coming from uh, Timor-Leste. Um, we have Ariadna Burgos um, is going to present on ethno-ecological challenges in sampling aquatic invertebrate species. So uh, the, the connection, having lived in Timor, I can tell you the connection might be a little shaky, but we'll see how we, how we get on. Uh, hi, Ari, can you hear us? Can you unmute yourself? I hear the music. I still hear the music. Still music. Now it's gone. Okay. Hi, Ari. Okay, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I will just tell you in what moment you pass the the PDF. Or um, 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 is me who passes the PDF. If you're sharing your screen, then I think it's you that's uh, passing it. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Share. Uh, yeah. If you think the connection would be better if we share it, then we can. I thought that was you sharing it, but it was. Is it? Uh, yeah, are, well, you, are you able to see it? Yes. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Ariadna Burgos. I'm from IRD, so the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development. I am currently living in Timor-Leste. I'm a Marie Curie fellow hosted in World Fish. My work is at in the interface of anthropology and ecology. I, I apply a, a field of research uh, that it's called 
ethnoecology. So just before going to the objectives of my presentation, I would like to let you know what is. Ethnoecology is the study of how people perceive, understand, use, and manage their environment. Local ecological knowledge refers to knowledge generated in everyday practice and interaction with the environment. This goes beyond indigenous knowledge and encompasses also other types of knowledge like Juliana just presented from Afro-descendants. Ethnomalacology, so malacology, in which I'm going to focus this presentation now, malacology is the study of mollusks. And ethnomalacology focuses on the ways people characterize, perceive, and interact with molluscan resources. So there are many types of ethnoscience or ethno -ex, ethnobotany, ethnobiology, ethnozoology, and so on. So um, just this drawing is to illustrate, um, um, this is from a book of the 18th century of a French explorer, French naturalist called La Villardière. And at the time he, he showed, he presented in his book how important was shells, shells and marine invertebrates for food in, this, uh, in these places that he was visiting in the Pacific Ocean. And also he recalled the importance of women in these fisheries. And he talked about the use of shells beyond food as body ornaments, as you can see in the right. So the objectives of my presentation is to examine different types of local ecological knowledge related to molluscan species and molluscan fisheries, and to unveil interdisciplinary methods to integrate local knowledge in fisheries research. So I have been working during the last 10 years in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Timor-Leste. This is the case studies I'm going to show you. And I have been deploying an interdisciplinary approach linking anthropology uh, methods, classical methods such as participatory observation, which includes, uh, uh, which means the, in, uh, the acting of the researcher uh, learning from local people while performing their own activities, their, acti their activities, and linking anthropology, classic methods with ethnoecology, geography, and archaeology. So Siberut in Indonesia. Um, this was a field made in the mangrove. So what was particular here, it was that in the mangrove, fishing, fishing was, a, was a, an activity exclusively perform my woman. Uh, men would work in the inland while women will, 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 would work in the mangrove forest fishing fish and looking for shells, looking for crabs and other types of activities. But the mangrove was the woman's domain. In here, there were a total of 40 species targeted. So 32 genus and 19 families, high diversity of species uh, looked for, and there were bivalves and gastropods. Um, so what was different between bivalves and gastropods is that bivalves were harder to get, but easier to get the meat out, where gastropods were more easy to look for, but to get the flesh out of the shell was time consuming and energy uh, consuming too. So, and there were also different between certain type of shells. And it was that uh, uh, some bibles and, uh, were considered, the fact of eating some bibles were considered more prestigious than eating a small gastropods. Just like us, when we eat lobster, might be more prestigious than to eat other species. In their systems, in their cultural values and systems, they had also uh, prestigious, which influenced it the type of shell they were looking for. Um, and here, this table shows the correspondent taxa between Mentawai names and Linnean taxa. So for instance, in 25 cases, I found that one Mentawai name corresponded to one species. But you could find also the cases where one Mentawai one one Mentawai name corresponded to three species. That was for Litorina 
glitorinidae, so very small shells, not really used all the time for food uh, and, and, for, and for the, um, and two, two occasions, I could see one, two names, two local names that corresponded to one species. So in total, 34 names for 40 species. This you have to imagine the mangrove, where here is the river coming and here is uh, the ocean. So there's a salinity. And in the salinity, uh, salinity difference. So we had a uh, very various type of mangrove forest on the on the on, on this area and local terminology that combine also Indonesian languages would classify the different types of uh, of forest so you could have uh, sabuk in the foreshore bakat koat which was the coastal mangrove uh, bakat dalan which was more in the interior that was important because it allowed me to uh, explore and inquire about what type of malacological associations were living in each uh, type of forest. So for instance, here in the coastal mangrove, you could find 14 species. Um, I used uh, drawings to, to communicate with the local people and they responded also saying about, uh, about friendship relationships. So uh, species were uh, friends and some there were some friendship friendship here friendship here and what it was interesting is that uh, these species are very localized ecological specific to certain type of habitats so you would not find some type of species in the back part of the mangrove um to collect this shell sorry to collect these two shells so sicoira and tainuktuk that were 80 centimeters inside the mouth. Women use their feet and they use their feet in a vertical uh, movement with a vertical movement, getting deep into the mud. It was not an easy task. Uh, and the identification of the shell came with the two. And after what they, they bring the shell up with their feet and collect it with the hand. There were two, three other types. There were many types of uh, techniques to collect shells, but for Geloina, which is this species here in the bottom, uh, Geloina, there were three different techniques. One with the hands, one with the feet, but the movement was different. The movement was horizontal and one with, the, with a machete. So the woman would trace with the machete lines on the mud, and when they hear the sound of uh, the of of the machete knocking Jeloina, they will pick it up. But they, they were able to different type of sounds of other type of shells that they didn't collect. So the recognition was with the with the hearing. Something very important in 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 toponyms. So something very important were toponyms, place names. So I found that. In here, in the Bay of Kature, where I was working, there were 92 local names in, in the, uh, throughout the coastline. This is 12 kilometers long, 12 kilometers long, more or less 45 kilometers of, uh, of coastline. And within that, like 200, each 200 meters, we had a local name. That was important because as Mollusks were so specific to one locality, then I could make questionnaires about the species abundance distribution of, uh, of different, sorry, the abundance distribution of different species. So for instance, I would ask them, okay, and Sicoira, where would you go to look for Sicoira? And then they would say, oh, Sicoira, you can find it in Malagai. Or Sicoira or Megu, you can find it in but Macalu. So we can see that 70 to 75 percent of the people were looking for this type of shells in this area in Bat Macalu, or were in the other ones in 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 Malagai. So it just gave an um, the distribution of this species. But you can also make a uh, retrospective analysis about where was this species in the past. So it could 
show you changes on, on the location of these species. In Atauro Timor Leste, we, we find all, almost the same, but here we are in another type of coastal configuration, coastal setting. So this is sandy beaches, rocky shores, and um, corals. And we can find also local names, toponyms all over the place, and even inside the ocean. So this gives us uh, a mean to interact with local people and to know exactly in what localities they are working or what localities they can find a shed. In, uh, in Timor Leste, so this was a publication that we did with Alex. In Timor Leste, also, they had a specific names to the different types of habitats. And this changed from one place to the other because they have three languages in Atauro. So they have a diversity of languages. So this is varied, varies according to, to language. And in each of these localities, we also find uh, a specific uh, molluscan fauna. So for instance, here we will find a uh, Tectus nilotucus. Sometimes it, it can come up to here and Tridagna crocea, we can find it here, but this was very specific. And also here you can see the different techniques deployed to uh, collect the different type of species. Sorry, I don't know if everything is going right. This doesn't mean that the um, this doesn't mean that fishing shells is easy task. Fishing shells is a very hard task, and, and being able to recognize the species is quite difficult. Uh, you have to walk very slowly because the valves of the shell can sh can close, and so you cannot see the species anymore. They melt completely. They they melt completely within their ecosystem. In New Ireland, in Papua New Guinea, uh, so there were also important sets of knowledge regarding the species. They were uses with the old shells that I will not develop here, but they were like a sort of ecological engineering of the coast with the, with the shells. So there were lots of knowledge and there were also high diversity of species used, each one having their own name. And also here we found the fact that shells were uh, used beyond food systems. Uh, so shells could be used for decoration and tools, for shell. Uh, perhaps we could try sharing the presentation from here and then Ari can try and connect with just sound to talk us through it. Ari, are you still with us? I did warn you the connection from Timor can be a bit tricky. Hi, Ari, can you hear us? Hello. Uh -huh. Okay. Hi. Ari, do you want us to okay, share the slides so and you can talk you hear? to them? Uh, can you see now? I have two more slides to show. So if oh, you okay. can see them, I just keep on this. Okay. Go for it. Go for it. Let's so try. I just got the video. I, I, I just got the video. So just to say that shells can go beyond food that they can be used for many types of different um, 
for courier trade, there's a big market, and the local knowledge can inform us on diversity and distribution status of the species, uh, on fishing techniques, on coastal change, on fishing dynamics, on uses of species, on traditional coastal management and trade and value chains at the local level. There are thus many uh, ethnoecological challenges uh, in ecological research and molluscan fisheries uh, now are often unreported and undocumented. And this has to deal with the fact that Western language and fishing surveys lack of a specific terms to acknowledge the diversity of techniques involved, gears, and habitats also that the local uh, that the local people name. And the fact these aquatic invertebrate fisheries are not reported, uh, underreported in 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 in, re in national reports often marginalize them in policies and management plans and, he and hidden the role of women in these fisheries. So there are many questions to resolve, but I would like just to highlight that how that, that what we are working now in Timor is how to encompass aqu aquatic invertebrate fisheries into pescas in Timor-Leste. So Alex talked about pescas yesterday, Pescas is more focused on fish, on vertebrate fish. So now we're thinking how can aquatic invertebrate fishers get into that monitoring? And also my question would be how can local ecological knowledge on species and fisheries be acknowledged and or reported in sea life space and fish base? Uh, you, now we have a nutrition tab. So it would be nice to have a, a tab saying local knowledge too. And just to end, uh, I have developed a collection in the museum. So we were talking about with Nicholas Bailey, the possibility of linking marine invertebrate pictures from the museum, easy access in sea life base, and as it done by fish base with the fish collection of the French Museum of Natural History. I uh, thank you very much for, for your hearing and look forward for answer any question. Thanks very much, Ali, that was, that was great. Um, yes, Daniel. Um, um, fish base um, and sea lab base um, can accommodate a lot of, um, of um, local knowledge, the local ecology knowledge, at least the part that is embedded in the names, because we have, um, about we have names about two hundred thousand in in about two hundred uh, languages, so uh, French and English and stuff are obviously there, but uh, we have also minor la language spoken only locally, uh, including including lots of Indonesian languages. So we we are ready to accept names so long uh, as long as we have a, a language that to assign. And uh, so we have a language, a place, and uh, a species or a group of species that have this name. And uh, there is a mark field where we can put the etymology or the use of that an animal that has, is assigned to this name. Uh, fish base and sea lab base have this already and have covered that uh, for many species. Or we could accommodate this uh, much of what has been said we can accommodate it readily. I, I will commit Thank you. A, a policy. Uh, for 30 years, we pretend that we accommodate local ecology knowledge only through a common name, which somewhere, it, it's good. It's good that we have that, but somewhere it's not we are talking about. We have nowhere where we can record that women uh, 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 use their feet to collect uh, the, the, the shells uh, uh, with, uh, 80 centimeters deep, at least in a structured way. Sure, we can always add text in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in remarks of the species or in, in the country, 
but but we have not really explored uh, uh, how to structure uh, the local knowledge in, in something that can be analyzed after. Deng is not. Uh, I do not agree. agree. I do not agree. I developed the common names table in Fishbase, and with the idea of um, taking in technological, not ecological, yeah, traditional ecological knowledge. And in fact, uh, when, when we were uh, looking into that, we have, we have um, a, a way of determining the etymology. So if the common names have the meaning of, uh, or, or have um, an indication of if women were naming them or not, then we can put that in as a remarks field at first. And um, we, can, we can actually associate that with human hues um, down the line. So we can actually do that work now for many of the um, ecological, uh, I always keep, Traditional ecological knowledge in the common names table. Actually, the common names table also includes recipes. <laughs> if 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 the name uh, is is uh, referring to a product of cooking, or uh, so it's rich. It's it's a table that has the potential of really capturing what people do with fish or invertebrates, given that. These are in the names of those um, animals. Ari, did you have a response or any further comment? No, thank you. I, I was happy to hear their, their thoughts and looking forward to, to interact more closely with the two bases, mostly with sea life base. And yeah, and to figure out how we can add more techniques that are not only called gleaning, but that might be, we can reach a more detailed uh, aspect of those fisheries. So thank you very much and looking forward to hear the next presentations. Great, thank you, Ari. Uh, before we let you off the hook, uh, Neil. Uh, Ari, thank you for a fascinating presentation, a very interesting and wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, I, I was interested to see whether you got an understanding of um, their knowledge of the resource status and how it's changed, and also whether they had traditional management practices, such as times of years when they would not harvest or um, knowledge how, what their customary practices were in terms of harvest. So mostly for this type of fisheries, um, I found that in all localities that I have worked, they are quite sustainable. Uh, people always say, if I want to go look for shells, I always get some of these shells. And it's because shells are available the entire year. They are predictable. We can know where we can go look for them, but they are not fish in a systematic uh, way. Not always, because they respond to um, low tide, to moon phases, the specific moon phases. So the moon phases where people would look for the most for these fisheries are during uh, full moon and no moon. So when they were, the, the tide is very strong. And uh, people cannot collect in the localities that I've been working, cannot collect more species that they can eat because they spoil very quickly. But Indeed, when, they, when there is a commercial, um, in, for instance, in Sibirut, there's one clam that was sell, that was looked for selling. The, it was exported to China. The, the pleat was done like in three or four months and the species completely disappeared. So when there's an external input, it goes out very quickly and the depletion is extremely, extremely important. So, I have not seen like more management than the natural management that goes with 
tides, with moons, and let's say in in Siberut, when there were dead people in the mangrove, when there were somebody who died in the mangrove, we could not fish for four or five days in order to respect the spirit of the person. And there were also some localities where we could not go fishing because it was a place of spirits and nobody would go to those localities. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next presentation. I, I'm very glad to see that that's kind of a, a topic of, of big discussion. It's close to my heart as well, having worked with sort of invertebrate fisheries in Timor for a long time. Part of the kind of practical challenge is also just measuring or recording the weight or length or size or what have you of what's being caught um, for a system like PESCAS. Okay, next up we have Ms. Suabasu uh, talking about uh, eDNA. Welcome, thanks for coming. Thanks. Good morning. Um, first and foremost, thanks, uh, Alex, for inviting uh, and graciously hosting this symposium. I was uh, excited in the sense that it was free. <laughs> so I said, oh, I better really grab the chance to come. And, and I was hoping that the presentation is chosen because among all the great scientists today, I saw uh, Adriana, the, the person who spoke, I, I always read her paper, so it was so exciting to see her virtually, you know, uh, sometimes you only see the names, so that's, that's life as a scientist, I suppose, uh, we learn from each other, and we try to make a difference in life, so um, the reason I wanted to come today is actually uh, to bridge a collaboration with World Free Center, and I know World Free Center has been here for a long time, uh, yet um, we didn't actually uh, have formalized anything. So I come from University of Malaya. Now, University of Malaya is situated in KL, and it's the oldest university. And we have been doing a lot of uh, research on fisheries. And the fisheries research, we even have a museum that has collection of fish collections way back from 100 years ago. It's a very uh, old collection, and we are trying to bridge collaboration to let people know that we have this museum. And at the same time, we also have very young uh, 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 lecturers who came back doing uh, research in fisheries, but they haven't yet uh, uh, exposed themselves. So um, I thought I should, should speak for the university and uh, knowing that uh, University of Malaya is also in the research in the research area of fisheries. So um, the title of my today's talk is actually looking at aquatic biodiversity uh, using eDNA tools. And of course, uh, this, today's work is about looking at uh, from a point of educational approach and addressing sustainable management. Why is this title so important? Uh, apparently, the last um, years, 10 years ago, environmental biodiversity, anything uh, related to data is never funded. It's never funded. The only way it's get, uh, it gets to be funded is when you work in, uh, and your, our funding comes from uh, Global Environmental Fund, from WWF, this kind of ways that we get funding. So a lot of scientists uh, shy away from biodiversity research because it's so hard to get funding. But in the last two years during the pandemic, uh, when there was a concern of zoonotic transmission coming from the environment to affecting the human health, the government suddenly uh, shifted and said, we are going to put funding into this. And that was, that was a breakthrough for uh, people who work in biodiversity biodiversity. So that's good news. So in this case, today the reason I'm here is also to share that we uh, recently procured a grant. And that grant is actually looking at uh, 
uh, the region called Para. Para is southern to Penang. So we recently uh, uh, procured a grant on environmental DNA. And the reason I, I thought of coming here because there's a lot of people here are interested in this kind of research. And that's how we establish collaboration. There are times when you go for conference, you will see that people have been working for uh, many years and uh, they're presenting their findings. But I have taken a liberty that the grant just, uh, we received it and we're going to embark on the project for the next two years and hoping that how can we contribute to the, uh, together with World Fish Center to look at this uh, project. So we know that climatic change is happening uh, in a fact that it's going to affect the environment. And we know that it has uh, direct impacts, indirect impacts. The last two days we are talking about that. And through that evidence, we know that we have to look at the ecosystem approach. So that is definitely a, a thing that is the new uh, way of looking at things. So what we are going to do, uh, which we wrote in the grant, is to look at the parameters of, from a point of biogeochemistry, uh, animal behavior, genetics, population genetics, and at the same time, we want to use a simple tool called eDNA. The reason for it is um, it's, it's getting very difficult to, to employ people to catch, and you might not be able to get the exact uh, species diversity just by through catch. So that uh, is one of the reasons we went on from an eDNA perspective. So our objectives, uh, for this grant, uh, we have recruited uh, engineers who works in nano, nano sensors, because you, we know the fact that there's pollutants in the environment. So the, in the group, we have nano, nano scientists. So they are coming out with fabrication of nano sensors to detect pollutants. We also are look, look, looking at uh, eDNA and uh, of course, the biogeochemical uh, properties, the climate change properties. And in these three months, we have bridged uh, collaboration with uh, Pakistan, India, Thailand. So we hope that uh, simultaneously when we do the project, it's doing it, uh, at the same time, a different region so that uh, we capture the, the climatic change and uh, parameters that is affecting a different uh, geographical region. So we have reached uh, four continents at the moment, five, uh, Japan, India, Pakistan, uh, Thailand, and Sun. We hope to have more so that uh, everybody can publish their own paper. And at one point of time, after the two years, we can actually um, consolidate. So these are the, uh, the methodology of the first objective. And uh, we are going to look at the water pollution index, the chemical process parameters, the biochemical parameters, the physiological parameters, and so on. So the second objective is where the eDNA comes in, and the sample will be collected uh, from water and sediments, and we will do uh, these processes and so on. The impact, of course, uh, hopefully it can touch policies, and uh, it acts on looking at uh, environment, freshwater ecosystem, and human welfare. Uh, and uh, this initiative was only is, is projected to all scientists, Malaysian scientists, working on different states. So University of Malaya is working on para, and other universities are working on different states. So everybody is uh, starting the project simultaneously of different states where it's affected by uh, any environmental pollutants. So um, this is, uh, we're gonna talk about something that is uh, affecting our environment. It's called the invasive alien species. The invasive alien species doesn't come from anywhere. It comes from the aquaculture site where uh, people breed uh, species that is not native in Malaysia. And then due to flood, you know, there's recent floods that is happening. A lot of these fishes escape through the native ecosystem. And a lot of people are not aware 
that these fishes have been uh, uh, affecting the native fishes, the endemic fishes, and they're eating them up. So uh, there is a big concern on, on this, where they have been uh, publication where a lot of these African catfishes are now in the ecosystem, in the freshwater ecosystem. And we have uh, visualized uh, evidence through collaboration with Department of Fisheries. We noticed that certain areas, which is very endemic to na the native ecosystem, uh, these fishes are actually uh, eating uh, the, our native ecosystem. So the problem we face with uh, getting people to understand this is because it's the eradication takes time no information on the pattern of dispersal uh, and there's always a trade-off do you know that when we talk about we are talking about biodiversity and we're talking about conservation and management but there's another group who talks about economics and how you know how economics can uplift the economy so it's always two parties uh, working at different different momentum so how do we get them and how do we bridge this? So this is where we need to look at how do we uh, have a, a collaboration that benefits both parties? And how do we ensure that this doesn't happen uh, in the near future? And of course, uh, public, um, like yesterday, the Hong Kong group was talking about a public perception, citizen science. So we also worked on that. And of course, lack of information on the interaction with native fish. Everybody knows this, but uh, who is going to believe us unless you provide evidence? So in the pandemic time, when we had a lot of problems and we didn't have money, uh, we asked six research questions. Uh, can DNA barcoding uh, identify invasive alien species? Uh, there's a method called LAMP. It's called loop-mediated isothermal amplification. Can it rapidly identify invasive species? How can the movement of invasive fish uh, be illustrated? How do we convince policyholders? And the fourth one, uh, aggressive behaviors of the so-called so invasive species. Uh, can any biomarkers be used to detect or to be correlated to aggression? And the fifth one, do invasive fish behave more aggressively compared to native fish in the same environment? And how do Malaysians perceive invasive fish and what can we do to raise awareness among the community? So uh, we, we've, we completed uh, these objectives. There's uh, five of them. And just to share with you that we started off, of course, with the simplest tool, barcoding, COI, we identified that and we also developed LAMP and LAMP is a isothermal amplification, doesn't need PCR. PCR. And uh, we developed that, this is all the methodologies and the ecological approach, we use a public software called Maxen and we started looking at data collection, looking at all predictive variables and we actually uh, looked at predictive model development and we try to analyze the data. And of course, for behavior and gene expression study, we mimic using the model beta. Beta is this small aquarium fish that is um, in Thailand, is known for the fighting fish, you know? And uh, because we could not go out and we couldn't study for big fishes, we use beta as a model to demonstrate to people how uh, is so-called domestication, but you are selecting for traits that is aggressive, you know, and what does it do, you know, and what happens to when you compare it to a native fish. And of course, perception of Malaysians about invasive alien species. So these are the results of the barcoding. Um, we could establish the, the interspecific divergence of, uh, of five folds higher, we selected the top uh, six alien species that was reported in Malaysia, and we uh, uh, developed the, the barcodes. And uh, these were the, the species used, right? 
um, based on all the methodology. And uh, we found that, that, uh, that the barcode showed distinctive differences between the invasive and the native within the species. And then we developed an uh, assay which uh, ecologists can use in case when they sample, they can actually identify uh, whether there was presence of invasive species in the waters. So we, we established that and we actually patent this method. And this method, hopefully we can work with uh, public and from a citizen science approach so that it can be done by anyone. And we hope to work with uh, uh, the communities, maybe with WWF and also with uh, schools. Then we went on to look at the prediction uh, uh, model of uh, what can happen uh, from the climatic change that is happening and what will be the suitable habitats that is crucial for the invasive alien species. And we noticed that uh, we, we provided maps based on the six species. And we published this in Aquatic Conservation Biology. Um, it is uh, at the moment, uh, one of the first reports that actually share what is happening in Malaysia. So we, we hope that this also creates awareness and we have identified potential areas where there is high risk of inv in, uh, invasion. Now you can ask me, how did we get the data on the invasive alien species? There is an app, there were people, citizen science report, you know, because they, when they catch when they catch invasive alien species, they take photo, right? And there is a place where they actually upload the photo. So this is the way we capture data. And we also capture data where uh, there are a lot of websites where people put up from the fish anglers, fish hobbies. When they catch, you know, catfish is something that they are proud of because the fish grows very big. So there's a lot of reports happening through the web. So my student actually, uh, captured all this data. We got almost like 100 over data that, that actually shows capturing of this uh, data and where we use the uh, environmental data. Now for the experiment, uh, this is being reviewed. And of course, the, the other two papers are published. And this is being reviewed at the moment because it's an experimental design we designed in our lab where we use uh, beta splendon. Uh, beta splendon is brought in from countries like Thailand, and uh, Thailand is the major exporter of splendons. They're very aggressive fighting fish, and people like the more aggressive, the more beautiful the color the fish exhibits. So there's a lot of importation of beta splendon. And what happens is when people are bored with this fish, they go and release it into the river. And in the river, we have our own native fish like imbilis uh, and a, a lot of different of beta species. So we wanted to create awareness in a sense that what happens if you have an invasive alien species that is being chosen based on aggression versus a fish that is growing very happily in the native environment. So we, we did that. So when we did that, this is the the, the, when we did based on uh, experiment design that is already uh, proof of concept, looking at mirror induced aggression and dilatic aggression, as you can see the photo up there. Uh, so you can see that we did the experiment. And what we found out is uh, between beta splendid and imbalis, you can see that um, the splendid is already uh, very comfortable to show aggression. So the, the genes that is exhibiting is like, it's okay, you know, it's, it's already, uh, it's not angry, but we think it's angry, right? But the imbalance shows a different, like a shock kind of expression, which made them to respond in fear. So these two experiments, we noticed that, uh, that the fish that is in the nature is being affected by uh, domesticated fish that was chosen based on aggression. So this was something very interesting and we're still waiting for the paper to come back. Hopefully we can convince the reviewers. And this is also being peer reviewed at the moment. 
uh, from a survey of 200 uh, people, uh, a lot of people knows about the existence of invasive alien species. Uh, most of them were bought from pet shops. And, and from here, you can see that the tendency of the Malaysians is when they get bored, they go and put it in a native system. And that's one. Another two is cultural. If there is some holiday, not holiday, there's some, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, autumn festival where the, you know you, you want good luck, you release fish into the ecosystem. So there is some cultural uh, behavior where they go and release catfishes into the riverine system. So this is being happening rapidly. So as you know, this is just to conclude, uh, we did four approaches, all right? And we managed to, uh, to, to uh, convince the policy that there is existing of invasive alien species. We provided a tool to rapidly and identify the alien species. And we also uh, gave information that protected areas in Malaysia are vulnerable to the invasion of alien fishes. And it, apparently Malaysians like invasive species compared to native species. And we hope to create that awareness. So uh, hopefully um, uh, we, we ho hope that uh, through this collaboration with World Fish Center, we could actually create awareness more, you know, hopefully. <laughs> and these are the people that we work with. Uh, from India is Dr. Rajiv. Uh, he works on the Western Guard. And in Pakistan is Dr. Sidra. Uh, so we have people and uh, from Philippines is Chulalongkong. So uh, we hope to create, you know, we understand that research uh, needs money, uh, and uh, through, but effective collaboration, we can go further. So we hope that, uh, uh, that this relationship can bring us further in, uh, in a collaborative. That's all. Thank you. Did I overshoot? <laughs> I think when you, when you, Great, thank when you, you. stood, I got up. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, at the back. Daniel. Probably time for a... Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm Fazli from WWF. Um, I'm just wondering when, during the study was conducted, is other aquaculture industries were engaged and, um, you know, to ask them about, are they aware about the guidelines of good aquaculture practices from the Department of Fisheries that maybe could avoid the invasion of the alien species to the freshwater system of Malaysia? So, um, you see, we have to thank the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment of Malaysia. They, they have understood that aquaculture is, uh, has its... Uh, disadvantage in a sense that when there's a climatic change, you know, sudden floods, especially the northern regions in Kedah, Kelantan, Terengganu, and some places in Pahang, you will see that uh, due to the flood, all the fishes uh, escape from the pond and it goes into the ecosystem. So what the ministry has done, this is uh, after awareness of what can happen, the ministry has engaged USM to handle Kuda and UMT to handle Trunganu, and then UMK to handle Klantan, uh, UMP Pahang to handle Pahang. So they have engaged various institutions to engage UMS Sabah to handle Sabah, Unimas to handle Sarawak. So they have engaged, but there are some states that is not being looked at yet, Joho, uh, like Nagisimla uh, not looked at because there's no report of uh, invasive species because they correlated the occurrence of invasive species to climatic change and aquaculture development. So with that, they uh, actually, when they get the grant, they get the grant based on the reports and they get the grant to make sure that in two years time, the whole uh, group, can actually report the incidents. 
we are trying uh, an eDNA approach is non-invasive. We're not gonna catch the fish because a lot of these fishes are endemic. A lot of these fishes are declining in number and we don't want to take, go and harvest fish anymore. So we hope to uh, do it in a non-invasive manner. Okay, uh, it's not a question just to share. Uh, I have done some work in Perak uh, throughout all four dams along Perak River. Maybe after this, we can share our... Uh, yeah, data. sure, sure. Okay. That, this, we have to thank Alex for yeah. bringing us together. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's great. Nice to see some collaborations happening, even within Malaysia. Yeah. Um, who knew you had to come to World Fish to meet? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes... Uh, it just requires one entity, and it's you, Alex. Thank oh. you very much. All right, thank you. So next up, we have uh, BJ Bajeda giving his own talk this time. Uh, yesterday, he gave a, a talk in for, for his colleague that couldn't make it. And he is going to present on genetic diversity of Indian major carp from four riverine ecosystems. Take it away. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Madam has already spoken about uh, fishes of Malaysia. So I want to share here some work on fish genetics. We have worked on Indian major calves. I will just present in few slides. Uh, as you know, India is having three Indian major calves. One is Labio Rohita. Now Labio Katla, another is Serena Mrigala. These three species, uh, Indian Majakars, are mostly cultivated in India and also, uh, also uh, it is distributed in Pakistan, also Bangladesh, India, in this region uh, uh, will found. So uh, as you know, this uh, Indian Majakars out of these three species, uh, Labio rohita is highly uh, cultivated fish species in India and uh, uh, mostly preferred fish species as for the taste. And if you'll see uh, Labio katla, Labio katla is a fast growing fish having bigger head size, smaller uh, body size, and uh, um, it grows faster, but uh, equally tasty. Similarly, if you'll see this uh, Mrigala, then Mrigala is or looks like little bit cattle, like Labio Rohita, but it is comparatively less preferred fish in cultivation in comparison to Labio Rohita and Labio Katala. So uh, if you'll see, uh, this is uh, Labio Rohita. So uh, especially uh, this most con con consumed fish and around 60 to 70 percent Indian out of the major carp cultivation, 60 to 70 percent, this only species is being cultivated. And if you'll see similarly, this Katala, Labio Katala, Labio Katala, uh, Labio Katala, this is second most preferred fish for cultivation. And if you'll see that Labio Rohita, these are three Indian majakas mostly cultivated in India. So we have tried to now what is happening. These fish species are now not much available in the Indian rivers. So conservation point of view, it is also important in natural ecosystems. And at the same time, uh, we have we are looking for one that Labio Rohita. We have gone for the selective breeding program at Central Institute of Freshwater Aquaculture, Bhubaneswar, and we have given the name. It is a joint Rohu for local name. We have given it is a joint Rohu, and we released in the name of joint Rohu. And only selective bred fish species is working in um, all the aquaculture farms. So now the uh, selective breeding program of uh, Katala is also going on and for uh, other prawn species is also going on in India. So the thing is, uh, for conservation point of view and also for selective breeding point of view, the stock characterization is also very important. For that, we have collected fish samples from different riverine ecosystems. We have got four major river, riverine ecosystems like uh, Ganga, 
then brahmaputra narmada and tista these four rivers we have collected the samples from different distant uh, places and we have used these are the sites we have collected from different uh, places of india and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, used the uh, mitochondrial cytochrome b chain for this stock characterization work if we'll see here this enter the mitochondrial genome is a circular dna where all the uh, cytochrome b atp 6 by 8 cox1 d loop all four genes mostly being exploited for fisheries uh, either stock characterization or molecular taxonomy all that works has been used so we have used the for this particular work cytochrome b gene for stock characterization work then if you will see Uh, that cytochrome b is around uh, the partial sequence around 370 uh, base pair genes and we have collected samples from these samples and we have analyzed using those softwares especially if you'll see cluster w bioedit and dna bejab especially this dna bejab we are using for editing of the genes uh, first we are sequencing the forwards sequence and also reverse sequence and we are aligning it using bedian bajer and editing it and then we are using for our stock characterization studies and if we'll see mega for especially phylogenetic tree analysis and all that we are using mega version 11 and dnsp network and early queen those softwares are we are basically using for the variability analysis among the different stocks and if we'll see that structure also that another software is being used for characterization of different type of stocks whether it's a ganga stock river stock is uh, linked genetically with brahmaputra river or not if they are distant then we are selecting those these marker genes we are identifying these marker genes the mar for marker assisted selection and we will advise the hatchery owners to take those kind of stocks distantly re genetically related stocks for next Uh, seed production and uh, uh, these are the uh, different you know uh, labio rohita and labio katla and abisidna migla these are the gene um, uh, accession numbers have been generated using cytochrome b and we have submitted to ncbi gen bank and these resources are already available even if this type of species even uh, available in entire asian regions they can download these sequences and can analyze for their purposes also to compare how the it is already in public domain so you can take it and you can analyze for your samples and whether they are genetically linked or they are becoming hybrid in nature in uh, natural ecosystem all these things can be studied so this is what regarding the haplotype network if you will see that uh, blue color is serin amrigala green color is labio katla then red color is labio rohita so like that this network can be developed using different types of softwares if you will see the phylogenetic tree then it is uh, labio katla and they have grouped uh, in one genetically there but however if you will see that mrigal is little bit related genetically related to katla but normally it actually it looks like row but when you analyzed we found that it is looks more genetically linked to their ancestral may, may be linked to katla so then this is what the anova analysis and um, within the population and between the population what are the different types of variability if we'll see among the group it is around 95% variation and within the group if we'll see that is around 4.68 point variations this kind of study we can use uh, using this genomic tools and if we'll see the haplotype network haplotypes uh, even if we'll see uh, using that uh, cytochrome b uh, gene in uh, rohu we have got around 57 haplotypes and uh, you know, 11 28 so i have listed here all the uh, types of uh, suppose 100 uh, samples you have taken but the out of 100 samples may not be all are same there is some nucleotide variations and if you'll see then there you will get another five or six or seven haplotypes so those haplotypes has been taken for uh, further genetic uh, com comparison studies uh, these are the few publications we have got on rohu katla and in my, in mitochondrial dna their mitochondrial dna part a and part b two journals are coming where this genetic stock type of papers are being published and uh, and uh, in part b mostly were genome announcement and the mitogenome announcements are being published in my 
in, in uh, these are some uh, papers and and uh, if you'll see this is one paper uh, few papers we have got in mitochondrial dna part b as a geno complete mitochondrial genome announcement so we have totally sequenced around four or five species and we published in this and fortunately i am the one of the associate editor in this journal so any paper if related to this uh, can send we'll encourage and uh, basically the chief editor is in china the professor liu and i am also co-associate editor in that so if anybody is having any paper can send uh, this is our group and this is our lab where we works and a few journals where I, I am associated with the editor. So anybody can send those papers and uh, this is what peace for health, peace for wealth and peace for all. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Very succinct talk. Uh, any questions from the floor? Yes, Mohammed. Actually, I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, in Bangladesh, Indian major cup, four species. Uh, first one is Labia Ruhita, then Katla Katla, is, you call it Labio Katla, yeah, then Labio Sirinas Nigola, and so Labio Kalbash. Uh, this is not my question actually. I just want to know about clarification. Why you clarification. Uh, skip labio calbasu? Uh, labio clarivos calbasu will not come under Indian major car. It will be a medium car. Oh. So there are medium calves, labio calbasu, labio bata. So many species are medium car, some few are also minor calves. So three categories of calves are there. So major calves are you know, Rohu Katla Mrigal. Is three. Um, I have a question. I just I was curious. You said that the um, they taste quite distinctly, or two taste similar, but one the um, uh, is it miglad is not is not particularly um, migral. Or was it is not particularly tasty? Is this because of um, their ecology, like what they're feeding on? Are they from quite distinct sort of habitats? Is that what's affecting the taste? Do you know? Oh, because uh, uh, it is also a very difficult question. They used to stay in same aquatic environment, same aquaculture pond, but uh, Rohu is a little tastier and uh, we have to have a detailed study of their biochemical uh, parameters maybe certain amino acids and uh, specific amino acids uh, maybe uh, like you know hilsa if you'll see hilsa hilsa has got uh, a very good test that that's why we used to tell it's a king of fish uh, so uh, we have studied that they have got few fatty acids which is adding to better aroma of hilsa when you'll fry it you'll have a better aroma so similarly Definitely, there may be some role of some specific amino acids present in uh, Rohu, maybe making it more tastier than Mrigal. And somewhat little bit, the feeding habit also may influence the taste of the, because that kind of material may be bioaccumulating and uh, in the body, so for the taste. Hi. If if I'm not mistaken, I saw uh, the the intraspecific divergence uh, for your cytochrome B as uh, most at the most it was zero point one, yeah, which is not a lot. So um, yet yet your populations are very structured. So are are these basins very remote or are they near? each other is there a possibility of interbasin exchange yes, yes, or not yes yes because the, uh, we have collected samples from different riverine ecosystems and there is a possibility of migration of certain fishes in closely related uh, sites there may be a possibility of uh, migration of those uh, species so when the sample size will be more 
and it will be taken from different uh, uh, more sides then more clear picture will come sometimes there is a possibility in farmers are taking and some hatchery owners are there are a lot of ranching programs where the government is also releasing the seeds in the river so there are now lot of uh, uh, for conservation point of view it's very important to see whether the stock is uh, different or the same stock and so those that's why this project actually we are running in our country thank you sir thank you thanks very much uh, now I'd like to welcome uh, Zarul Hashim um, to tell us a bit about the origin of Highland Fish's hypothetical proposition. Welcome, Zarul. Assalamu alaikum and hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Zarul Hashim. I'm from School of Biological Sciences, University of Science, Malaysia. So before I proceed, I would like to invite all of you, especially our distinguished guests, to USM if you have time after this. Okay. Uh, we don't have a specific fisheries uh, department, but rather we have a School of biological sciences that covering almost everything. Okay. So, uh, okay, again, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my research, uh, my experience uh, since uh, actually 15, 16 years ago, since I did my master's degree. My background is on freshwater fish ecology. And I've been studying uh, fish diversity and distribution in highland, uh, low order highland streams. So the topic here based on our mini expedition to Royal Balloon back in 2015. Okay, been studying uh, highland fishes, I have one question, which is uh, the first one is, are there any fish above the waterfall? So when we talk about waterfall, there is a specific criteria of the waterfall that I'm looking at. The first one, the waterfall must be away from any road access. It must be located deep in the forest to, uh, so that I can cancel out any possibilities of people transferring or releasing, releasing fish to the river. So I came up across to this one river, which is uh, fascinating to me, All right? Okay, as you can see here, okay, this is uh, my student and you can see how high the waterfall is. So the waterfall is about 65 meter high. And also you can see the waterfall is like, it's a shower like waterfall. So by applying our common sense, there is no way for the downstream fish can swim or pass across the waterfall to get to the to the upstream above the waterfall. So during this expedition, I took the chance to go uh, above the waterfall, which is quite hard. We have to come across, a, uh, we have to do some, a bit of rock climbing, okay? And you know, to bring our electro shocker and all the equipment is quite hard. I would like to play one video here. Oh, this is a PDF. Okay, never mind. Uh, so these are take these pictures are taken during uh, wet season. So you can see the volume of water. Also, uh, 
we can also know the, the force, the power of the waterfall. Like I said, it's almost, I think it's impossible for any fish to pass this waterfall. But the best part is we found two species above the waterfall. And the question is, how this species gets there in the first place? That's the question that I'm trying to answer. I don't have any answer yet, but we're proposing uh, three hypotheses. Okay, this is a schematic diagram of the waterfall. Sorry. Okay. We went to the above waterfall. We covered about two pools uh, within uh, 50 meters and also uh, several pools below the waterfall. So the elevation is uh, 403 meters and also 334 meters above sea level. All right, this stream, Sungai Kuoi or Kuoi River is located in the Royal Balloon area you need to have a special permit to enter this uh, forest so the nearest entrance is pulau banding okay it's about uh, pulau banding is about three hours drive from here okay so you need to get a boat from pulau banding and uh, go to the royal balloon area okay so this is our common uh, sampling gear, backpack electrofisher. So you can imagine we have to bring this up across the, uh, during the, our rock climbing. We have our nature guide to help us out to set all the rock climbing gears. And these are the results. So species in red are those that we found above the waterfall, only two species. But we found uh, seven species total below the waterfall. Okay, we, we, we understand uh, how fish distributed along a stream. The fish from upstream can easily uh, distribute it to downstream. But from downstream to upstream, there is a different question. Okay, these are the fishes. Bivario regina and Chana strata. Chana strata can commonly found in lowland river, in lakes, but for Divario regina normally found in low order streams. So these two species have no special limbs or doesn't have any adaptations that enable them to pass the waterfall. Okay, so they cannot uh, resist the stream power too. With no ground base to jump and stop, and the 90 degree slope shower like waterfall. So the question still remains how did the fishers manage to get to the top of the waterfall? So we came, we come up with three hypotheses. The first one was the first one is the world was once flooded and there were no limitations to fish distribution. The fish can go anywhere they want during the flood. Secondly, the fish species assemblage was separated by land uplifting during the mountain formation. And the third one is, there are other stream branches enabling fish movement into respective stream. But by looking at the topography uh, map, there is no other stream branches that connect this uh, to Sungai Koui. So uh, in my sense, I can cancel out the third hypothesis. Okay, but looking at the timeline, uh, the timeline event, we have the phylogenetic tree of freshwater species. From this phylogenetic tree, I think we can find the ancestor species. Okay, and the, there is a paper stating that the origin of freshwater fish is from 
marine species. And from journals, we know that land uplifting, the formation of mountains in Royal Bloom, occurred million years ago. So by looking at the phylogenetic tree and the land uplifting, most probably the land uplifting occurs first, then only the, the, the ancestor species exists. Then we have the historical flood during Prophet Noah. I don't know much, I don't know much about this, but still looking for evidence. Again, looking at the timeline event, the recent, the most recent one is the historical flood. So if we line up these events, okay, most probably the land up lifting occurs first. Then we have the historical flood. And probably that's the reason why uh, a paper stated that the origin of freshwater came from marine species and, and therefore my findings. So this timeline event actually support my first hypothesis. Okay, from fish base, I'm looking at the species distribution. For Divaro Regina, uh, distribution across Asia, India, Myanmar, Thailand, and Northwestern Malaya, and also reported from the Mekong Basin. So we knew that the Asian region were once a uh, one big land. From journals, the genus Divario have 38 potential valid species in Asia. And Divario asamensis can be a synonym to Divario regina. So looking at speciation, assuming the first hypothesis is correct, what are the chances of the ancestor species at different locations undergone speciation, speciation and end up having similar, similar genus or species? We know there are lots of factors, among others are environmental pressure, adaptation, natural selection, survival of the fetus, and the last two, my suggestion, embedded species template, or it could be the original species population, okay? These are my add-on uh, that come up from the findings, okay? It's not confirmed yet. So at the moment, we have no exact answer or any confirmed answer or evidence, but my future plan is that to find more evidence at greater waterfall or at other places, find more evidence to prove the first hypothesis, and also to conduct more detailed analysis on the species found, especially uh, DNA, stable isotope analysis, and et cetera. Uh, that's all for my presentation, uh, a short one, I believe. Uh, these are some pictures from the from other rivers in the Royal Bloom. Thank you. Thanks, Cyril. I did have a feeling Daniel would have a yeah, well, comment. Um, <clears throat> among your hypotheses about, you have completely omitted um, vectors, the animal vectors. And uh, Charles Darwin, among others, have, has, uh, studied uh, the problem of uh, distribution of fish and distribution of frogs and other things. Um, and um, among other things, they, uh, with fish and frog, uh, they are distributed notably by being stuck, the eggs being stuck on the feet of, sea, uh, of, um, of aquatic birds. And that it's it bizarre that you don't have such hypotheses, you, you, you ought to have, besides geological hypotheses and biblical stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you certainly need to have um, hypotheses, uh, including animal vectors, animal vectors, because uh, quite a few mammals also have eggs 
that are stuck. And uh, I don't know specifically is this, uh, this fish, what kind of egg they have. And they, they, they have adhesive eggs, but uh, it, is, it is a mode of distribution of, mm -hmm. for example, for European fish that uh, from one pond to the other, uh, that uh, is used a lot. <clears throat> That has happened a lot, mm -hmm. and you you definitely have to look at at uh, Charles Darwin on this. The, 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 how animal are distributed, how plants are distributed, because you the three geological hypotheses that you have are not enough. You 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 have to consider animal vectors, and and I think this is going to be a bird that does the job. Okay, thank you for that. Because uh, we, when we came up uh, with these three hypotheses, we have uh, limited information on about other species uh, on the herp herpetal fauna. Uh, some scientists suggest to me uh, if there is a possibility of certain bird species can uh, travel, uh, capture the fish and bring the fish upstream. But, uh, sorry? Yeah, so uh, that's the, the, the limitation of information that I have currently. Uh, yeah. You ought to include that among the viable hypotheses. Mm -hmm. uh, many, two or three of the uh, geological hypotheses yeah. that you have are absolutely untenable. You don't even have to look at them. Mm -hmm. So more realistic hypotheses is animal vectors and you have to look at that and look at the literature about uh, about it uh, yeah. what yeah, yeah. animal vectors can they be mm -hmm. okay thank you sir any further comments for Zara? thanks very much okay that takes us to uh to lunch um and after lunch, we'll have four more presentations. Uh, the last four, um, some more around aquatic biodiversity, um, and then a, a bit about partnerships. So the last two talks will be uh, about partnerships with Aquaria and partnerships towards uh, sustainable financing of, of fish base as well. So enjoy your lunch. Uh, for those online, we will be back in one hour. Hi everyone, my name is Celia Shunter and I'm from the Swire Institute of Marine Science in Hong Kong and I'm very happy to be able to um, give this talk here at the Fish Bay Symposium in 2022. My schedule this week is full of lecturing, hence I will only be able to attend sporadically, um, but I do hope to bring across um, in this video um, uh, what I want to say and hope to get to chat with you or, or for us to be in contact through other means. What I'm going to talk about today is something that I have mentioned last year already, but we've been working really hard on getting um, uh, scientific evidence for, for our claim. And the idea is to use genetic diversity measures as a simple um, uh, first diagnostic um, of the health or the decline of fish populations. So the question is, can we prioritize species conservation by measuring the genetic diversity in fish populations? And I'll start with an example here, which is um, uh, the fan mussel, Pina nobilis. It's a very large bivalve uh, of the Mediterranean Sea that is very long lived. And it's been exploited for many decades, um, and therefore it's been actually um, um, protected by the European Union uh, since 1992. And after protection and somewhere in the in the marine protected areas, it has um, increased in population, but it's still decreasing outside of the marine protected areas. And but on top of that, unfortunately, there was a, a pathogen that had arrived and creating a massive mortality uh, in and around about 2016. So most of the Spanish population uh, really uh, reached nearly 100% of mortality by 2017, and there are really very few individuals left. 
So we can use this now as an example of where we know it had a, a, a very massive or a long term decline, but then also a very massive decline um, over a very short period of time. And so the idea is, can we use the a genetic marker like CO1, which is a widely used marker in the barcode of life? So we have this ample database um, that exists um, uh, in, from all kinds of uh, scientific studies measuring CO1 genetic diversity of all kinds of species. So we have this, this ample um, uh, database already available or information available. The question is, can we use that to then detect declines um, in certain species? And can we uh, actually you know, link these population declines to genetic diversity, which is um, basically the uh, would provide an evidence uh, for us to use it as a, an early diagnostic marker. So what you see here um, is uh, the, the genetic diversity here on the bottom. So we have from very, very low on the left to, you know, decent amount of genetic diversity within the CO1 marker. And uh, this is a um, a graph of all the bivalves uh, that were um, that exist on databases such as NCBI. So taking the CO1 sequence of them um, and understanding uh, what kind of uh, levels of uh, genetic diversity are found um, across all bivalve species that exist in the databases. And you can see that there's these uh, kind of two, um, um, uh, let's say, curves, uh, one that has uh, the distribution towards the lower end and one that has the distributions towards the higher end of, of genetic diversity. And in fact, um, they do come with uh, um, correlated with uh, species that are uh, known as threatened, such as vulnerable or uh, critical endangered or endangered um, by the IUCN. Uh, here on the left, you can see that it's pretty clear that using those species, those 29 species that have that have a, a knowledge about the, a certain decline, you can see that their genetic diversity is much lower uh, than for the ones uh, that we would call control, let's say, that are of least concern or that we have no evidence of decline at least. So you can by using database um, information, um, so all the CO1 sequences and, and uh, genetic diversity, it seems that we can actually pinpoint um, if a species is threatened or maybe not threatened. And so for Pina nobilis, our uh, bivalve that um, uh, had a huge decline, um, uh, Petit, uh, uh, Natalia, uh, Petit Marty, um, my, my postdoc in my lab, she collected samples from different places around the Mediterranean and measured their um, uh, genetic diversity. And as you can see, the Spanish samples over here have a very extremely low level of genetic diversity, basically to the point that they um, there is no diversity. Um, and as you can see, generally, this whole species uh, belongs to um, uh, the ones that, you know, in the threatened area of genetic diversity. But you do also see that there's a bit of difference uh, between the different locations. And, and this is something to consider when we think about this tool down the line, as it's a more localized tool. And we need to understand uh, populations, not globally, but um, um, according to their, um, their locations. So Pina nobilis likely lost its genetic diversity before its protection and jointly the capacity to face new diseases. And this is really key now in the, in the time of climate change and um, a lot of anthropogenic um, effects, uh, where if um, we diminish the genetic diversity of a population due to overexploitation, for example, these populations are just not going to be able to deal um, with um, other stressors such as increase in temperature due to climate change. So the question is, um, can we use this as an early diagnostic tool for the conservation status of, of species? So here, um, uh, Natalia looked at all kinds of different um, organisms, including even insects, but you can see here the bivalves down here, and on the left we have our fish. And the gray part is are the ones that are non-threatened, or at least we don't have any evidence of threat, and the white ones are, are the ones that are threatened. And as you can see, obviously there's a much larger number and therefore more variability for the non-threatened, um, but uh, you have higher, bio, uh, higher, higher genetic diversity from here, the axis on the left, 
this is the low di uh, low genetic diversity, high genetic diversity. So you can see a difference between uh, the samples that are uh, known to be non-threatened, or at least we have no evidence, uh, um, versus the ones that are threatened. And so uh, seeing this extreme difference for fish, uh, we kind of went down further that path to find more evidence. So is loss of genetic diversity and adaptive potential um, uh, by exploitation? Can we actually use an early evaluation method uh, by using CO1 um, and measure the nucleotide diversity? And so the idea of using genetic markers uh, to understand um, exploitation of species is not something new. Um, uh, you know, several um, um, prominent people in the field have been looking at these things already 10 years ago. However, because of all the discussion forth and back about using one marker or another, um, the, uh, the, the effect of genetic diversity can be um, very complex. Um, so it's not just the overfishing, it might be the age, it might be the turnover of the species. So there are a lot of factors to consider. Um, that's why we, we uh, don't necessarily want to, to pinpoint exactly that there's genetic diversity due to an uh, exploitation, but we're uh, trying to build um, a simple um, detection method where you understand, okay, there is low genetic diversity, no matter necessarily what it is due uh, to, um, but it means that we need to prioritize this, this um, population uh, of this certain species in this area, because it won't be able to face um, any further stressors such as climate change. Um, and as an example, uh, we are using the South China Sea fishery status um, um, that many of you probably know um, has a lot of depletion or overfishing. Um, um, and as you can see here by the red dots, um, there's a lot of um, high fish consumption in this area. And so we picked a few species um, um, that are of all kinds of different levels of, of commercial value, for example, high commercial value. Um, um, or just uh, commercials over here, uh, then we have minor commercial and we have also not commercial. And uh, this helps us distinguish a little bit the, the different genetic uh, diversities and what we would expect uh, for, uh, to see for these fish. And in addition, we use farm fish, such as the Saba hybrid grouper, so a grouper that really just exists by, um, um, well, um, that's what we believe, we, it was, it's uh, made in a Petri dish. Um, although we don't know if, if there's now wild individuals of this, but generally there's very low genetic diversity, obviously, if you're, if you're produced in a, in a farm. So we can use this uh, to um, where we assume that they definitely have low genetic diversity, kind of as a control individual. So we need to have our comparative frame again, just like we saw before with the, um, the bivalves. And this is what you see here. Uh, we have 1,260 species of, of different fishes um, that are low concern by the IUCN. And we took their CO1 uh, values, their uh, nucleotide diversity values, as well as we have 112 species um, uh, that are um, registered as vulnerable and endangered or critically endangered. And, um, and you can see here on the right, uh, the way this is, is mapped, you have the threatened ones, and once again, and the non-threatened ones here on the right, and once again, you see that we have these two quite separate um, um, uh, distributions when it comes to uh, genetic diversity. The threatened ones are here with the lower values of, of genetic diversity, and uh, the non-threatened ones have much higher levels, even, of course, there's a bit of variability. So, how do we uh, kind of look at this genetic diversity um, to, to understand it as a simple um, goal of, of determining priorities for further research? So we know that uh, these mostly non-threatened ones, or at least we have no evidence for, for um, exploitation, uh, they have low priority uh, for any um, um, kind of conservation. The ones that come over here in this kind of yellow area, let's say, um, are the ones that might be starting to decline. Um, and therefore, there's a medium level of, of um, necessity to conserve. And then here, over here, we have the ones that have a very high level of, or very low level of genetic diversity, and therefore a high priority for conservation um, uh, matters or management. So here we have um, 
our two highly commercial species that I mentioned before, our, our um, uh, yellow croaker and um, the Bombay duck, they are over here. Both of them fall within the high priority range. And here you can see a, an overview, and I'll walk you through it a little bit, where we, where we then start to prioritize. The first priority are the ones that are high priority, medium priority, and low priority. And we have um, the different fish coming from different fisheries. So um, uh, the blue was uh, Balearic Sea. We have the Fujian Sea uh, from China here in purple, uh, the different fish species. And then our gray samples here are the are the farm fish. And as you can see, the Saba grouper um, uh, over here is would be of high priority because it has uh, quite low diversity levels. And uh, this is what they're ranked by. And so we can see what actually falls uh, within this diversity, genetic diversity level of a, a farm fish. Um, and, uh, you know, surprisingly or not surprisingly, but shockingly, a lot of the, the uh, fished um, fish or the highly commercial fish, even from the Balearic Sea, as well as the Fujian Sea, uh, fall within this range of, of, of being highly um, or having very low diversity and therefore being of very high priority for conservation. And then with this information, having this information and gathering all the information about the CO1 uh, nucleotide diversity, genetic diversity in each of the populations of these fish species, we can then estimate uh, what kind of decline we would uh, see over the next um, uh, generations, right? Um, you know, tens to, to um, hundreds of generations, depending on the, on the species that goes faster or slower, obviously. And you can then calculate the idea of um, um, how fast uh, the, this genetic diversity will decline in the future. So the idea now is to um, uh, basically use this early detection method where we saw that estimates of nucleotide diversity are a good proxy for an um, approximation of the conservation status. And we evaluated these species from the East China Sea and we saw that there's evidence of being threatened by loss of genetic diversity. And some of these, especially the highly commercial ones, have very extremely low genetic diversity. Some other species also, um, uh, even though they're not com uh, have a commercial interest, but they are common um, um, bycatch, for example, in trawlings. Um, so here we have, if you want to learn more about exactly each species and, and uh, what kind of generation time they have and what um, uh, possible um, um, reason for, for certain uh, genetic diversity losses, please do go on and have a read at this paper. Here you have the DOI, which is uh, probably shorter to remember. And so we present this, uh, what we believe really much needed, simple diagnostic of conservation status of fish species. So once again, we're not trying to argue that it's, uh, it's um, the over-exploitation that is uh, 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 decreasing this um, this um, uh, genetic diversity, or if it's due to something else, um, environmental factors, or even already climate change. But um, we do need to know um, if there is low genetic diversity in populations so that we can um, uh, focus uh, conservation efforts on, on these areas, because as we, I said before, these populations will not be able to deal with further climate change or environmental factors. So can we incorporate the CO2 genetic diversity measures into the database? And this is what um, I want to propose a little bit more um, directly today. Um, so we can, uh, as you saw before, with kind of green, uh, yellow, and red, we can propose this, um, <laughs> you know, what we usually have for, for fires or for uh, floods, um, where you can have a level of um, you're doing okay in a species or in, in this uh, uh, locality for the species, um, you know, you are starting to have a bit of a low um, um, uh, popular, uh, genetic diversity, or you really are of high conservation concern in terms of your genetic diversity and your low capability of being able to deal with any other stressor um, um, in the environment or due to climate change, etc. So I guess what I'm asking today, if there's a possibility to add this into uh, fish base as a kind of priority meter, because there is a lot of CO1 uh, genetic diversity information out there in the databases, we just have to compile it and put it into a, a nicer form where it can be used as a very um, kind of um, simple um, 
indication of, um, of the need for conservation due to uh, genetic loss. And with this, I hope to get to discuss um, uh, some of this um, with you either this week or, or another time. Please do write me an email um, if I'm not around as much, because um, uh, it would be nice to, to keep um, you know, this um, collaboration even uh, further and possible, possibly we can try and apply for some funding to be able to, um, to push this forward and uh, get genetic diversity measures also onto uh, fish base. And I do want to thank uh, Dr. Natalia Petit Marti, who is um, has now back, moved back to Spain, and she is working on um, finding even further evidence for this in um, in the European hake species, where she's doing large scale analyses uh, to understand um, um, genetic declines due to fishing pressure. So there will be more coming out uh, from this area. And of course, uh, Min Liu, who provided all the samples from um, uh, Shaman University. And with that, please get in touch um, and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you to Celia. Uh, I can confirm that Celia is online um, to answer any questions. So yeah, Daniel, let's just confirm that Celia can hear us yes. and that she's online. Ah, Hello. Hi, <laughs> welcome virtually to Penang. Uh, over thank to you, you, Daniel. Yeah, sorry for not being there. The semester is in full throttle, so we're a bit um, excited um, to have 30,000 students back on campus, but it's a bit chaotic, so. <laughs> so I think that what you presented is nice, and uh, this could certainly be included in fish base, but I, I, I found it uh, wild, though, that uh, in, in, your, in, your, in the picture you, show, you showed with from the lowest uh, fish, the fish with the lowest diversity to to the fish with the highest, the the Bombay duck was uh, was the fish with the lowest diversity, and yet it is right now exploding in uh, in 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 the East China Sea and dominating um, the catch of trawlers, and it has uh, eliminating eliminated everything else. And uh, it is it is an invasive species actually in the system, um, and um, the the uh, lack of oxygen or the the hypoxic situation in the East China Sea has encouraged this fish to to proliferate to a tremendous extent. Yet it is the ones with the lowest. So so that is either an outlier or something doesn't work. Uh, so yes, I agree, and I know about um, how kind of I wouldn't say it's popular, but how common it is in in catches right now. Um, so this meter um, can then be used as um, kind of a first diagnostic to then go and and dig a little deeper. Um, so we can't use it as uh, you know you definitely have low um, genetic diversity. It must be because of um, uh, overfishing, because of course there's a lot of different factors that can play a role. Uh, maybe the population that we have collected there is, um, as you said, as an invasive species. A lot of invasive species do generally have uh, some lower levels of genetic diversity. So there's always a lot of factors to um, keep in mind. And of course, we were trying to um, oversimplify it to kind of have this, this meter, but um, it doesn't mean that um, it's because of elevated fish, fishing pressure or um, uh, that we're pinpointing the exact cause of low or high biodiversity, uh, sorry, genetic diversity, um, but it allows us to um, kind of focus conservation efforts to see if, uh, to then go the step further and do this evaluation to see if we find a, a causation. Great, thank you. Um, just one online, Rainer has his hand raised. So Rainer, can you unmute yourself? Yes, uh, we have found something similar recently in, in Western Baltic cod, and it explains a bit what, what make, makes up genetic diversity. Why, why is it low? And it turns out that it is missing year classes. And year classes are, are part of the population that have, has been born at a certain place and time. And they kind of are imprinted by that. And normally they go back to that place and time to reproduce. 
So if you have men and every year, that's a different location that is successful in, in uh, producing offspring. So if you have many year classes, you have many kind of parts of the population that are, have a chance to reproduce successfully, no matter where in a given year, the best spot and time is. However, if you, if, if you reduce the year classes, you lose that information, you even lose uh, historical spawning places. They don't go any there anymore. So it's a, uh, and, and you, so, so the, the completeness of the age structure is one indicator, but if you don't have age as you don't have in most populations, then you can use length frequency. And if you have a healthy population and an unhealthy one, you compare the length frequencies and the narrow one is the one with a low diversity. And so these are correlates which explain the biological background of what you find in your genetic uh, diversity. But it's, it's really that. And, and you're right, it's highly correlated with resilience against climate change and anything. If they have low diversity, they cannot react. So, so please make, your, make a link to your presentation available, then I will send it to some colleagues who, who may be able to do more with it. So Thank you. One of the first um, kind of ideas with this was that there is a lot of information out there. So a lot of studies, you know, they use a certain um, CO one marker. They look at one population over there, then it's another population of another species over here. There's a lot of information out there in the literature, but it's not being compiled um, and and made kind of more readily available to um, you know see kind of bigger patterns. And uh, that is kind of the first idea here that um, uh, uh, we can use this this data that's out there and um, get it compiled and uh, try to have some kind of um, you know categorization um, and then we can see if we if this certain species or population needs to have uh, uh, further studies to then go down the line to see if it really is uh, low genetic diversity because of overfishing or for other reasons. Yeah, if I may quickly uh, while I have the floor respond. The problem with this information is that it is uh, highly recent, so it's really, and it changes. Now, new year classes don't change so, so fast, but still it changes, and you have to have it for every population. That is a problem because once we put something like this in fish space, people expect, expect it to be complete and current. Now, how do we do that? Now you see the issue. Now you see the reason why mostly in fish space we have restricted ourselves to medium to long-term properties that change every 10, 20 years, and then we can update it. But if it changes annually, we have a huge problem. However, we do that for about 1,000 commercial stocks. We try to keep track of their annual stock assessments and, and, and have those. So we do it, but it means we have a, a person dedicated to doing only that. And so there's money involved. So I like your idea, but I just want to point out, if, if we take it on, we have to be serious about it. And some institution then has to back it up with a manpower or women power. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Jessica. And uh, over there, there you go. thank you. Uh, Celia, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I think part of what Daniel was getting at is sometimes it's not so much why does it have low biodiversity, but what are the consequences of that? And if it's a species that's proliferating like a weed, then we're probably less worried about it. Having said that, um, one of the things that frustrates me no end about the IUCN listings is how many data deficient species we have. So my question to you is, did any of your histograms include uh, data deficient as part of the LC? And if not, uh, it occurred to me that you could map the data deficient species across those distributions and say, so how many of these are probably looking a little suspect? Thank you. That's a great question. And admittedly, no, we have not looked at uh, data deficient versus least concern to see if, um, yeah, if there's a deviation between those two categories. Uh, great idea. Um, it's something to look into, yeah, for sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Celia. Um, that is all of Thank the you. questions. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the semester. <laughs> See you in the meeting tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> yes. 
So now um, we have your snooks um, live and in person. And Jos will be presenting on fish diversity studies in Central and Eastern Africa from morphology to genomics. Um, although we have seen them in the pond already. Um, so, um, let me just... Okay, um, what I'm going to present today is a bit different from my traditional uh, talks during the Fish-Based Consortium. Uh, where I mostly talk about our activities within uh, Fish Base for Africa project, as I call it. Um, and you see it, uh, it's, it's through a series of five years programs that are sponsored by the, the Belgium uh, Development uh, Cooperation and Humanitarian Aid. And uh, there are two dedicated team members that uh, regretfully could not come. Uh, this time, Gert Borden and Tobias Muschot. And um, within that Fish Base for Africa program, we have two main tasks. That's uh, update um, the Fish Base database on African fish, freshwater fish and brackish water fish. And that's already a huge task. Uh, and then also a large component of training training of uh, mainly African scientists that we invite for three months to have a training in fish base and uh, fish taxonomy. Uh, but what I want to talk about this time is about the interaction with the rest of the ichthyology team, uh, which kind of forms a basis uh, for discussions amongst the fish base team members and the rest of the team, uh, because we study uh, a lot of uh, biodiversity of fishes in Africa. Oops, sorry. Um, and I want to switch immediately to um, cichlids, one of my favorite fish groups. Um, almost one out of 10 freshwater species, fish species is a cichlid. So it is an important group in every way that you look at it from a scientific point of view and from a fisheries point of view. And by the way, these are not all African fish. Uh, there's also South American fish and Asian, uh, a couple of Asian species in there in that slide. But let's return back to Africa. Um, what you have as a unique situation in Africa is what we call the cichlid lakes or some people call it cichlid lakes. It's in East Africa. Um, so we are in East Africa here, and you have a couple of uh, deep lakes like Malawi, Tanganyika, Kivu, Edward, and then you have a, a shallower lake, Lake Victoria. And what have these um, lakes in common is that they all have a large assemblage of uh, cichlid fish and you can see the the figures on it i hope you can read it it's about for the lake victoria region which not only includes lake victoria but also the smaller uh, smaller lakes albert edward and george and kivu there's about 700 of them um, that's already a staggering number but also 99 percent is endemic meaning that only it, they only live in one particular lake. Um, lake Tanganyika, the oldest lake, is, uh, has about 250 cichlid species. And also there, almost all species are endemic, only living in that lake, nowhere else in the world. And Lake Malawi is the highlight. And I've been living uh, on the shores of Lake Malawi for three years. And we estimate that there are about 1,000 cichlids species and 99% is endemic. Um, 
I want to specifically talk a little bit about the haplochromine cichlids of the Lake Edward system. It's a fairly small lake within those large uh, lake systems, which makes it easier um, to, to, to study and to understand evolutionary relationships. Um, and this study is part of uh, a PhD student of mine, Nathan Franken. And uh, we do this study in collaboration with uh, some other scientists, Martin van Steenberg and Hannes Vardal. Uh, why is that? Because uh, we throw in some genetics and genomics, and I'm not an expert on that. Um, so we need to collaborate with uh, other scientists on this. So again, back to the numbers. Um, we are now talking about Lake Edward system. Uh, we are not yet there. We're uh, trying to figure out as a first step how many species there are in there. And we estimate that there are a maximum about 80 species. If we talk about that uh, Lake Victoria region superflock, as they call it, of haplochromine cichlids, there are two terms that are always coined, and that's adaptive radiation and explosive speciation. And when I say explosive speciation, I really mean explosive. Uh, explosive certain, certainly in the Darwinian uh, mode that uh, uh, Daniel was referring to, and we'll come back to that later. So these are just some examples of, uh, of some of the fish that uh, are living in the area and that part of that adaptive radiation. Um, talking about Darwin, Darwin's ex, um, prime example of uh, speciation were Darwin finches. Um, and you will see here illustrated, um, they supposedly originated about 3 million years ago and then uh, radiated into some 15 species. We are talking on a whole other level here, we are talking about 700 species in the Lake Victoria superflock that possibly originated only 200,000 years ago. Okay, so let me present them in the kind of adaptive radiation way uh, next to this explosive speciation. Uh, what you have here is some representative of six trophic gills, if you want. So you have all kinds of specialists in these different lakes. And these actually are replicates. Um, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so you just have some examples. And interesting thing is that they also show eco uh, morphological adaptations and specializations. Uh, for example, the molluscivores have large pharyngeal jaws with molariform teeth that enables them to crush the mollusks. Uh, algae scrapers, scrapers have numerous teeth for scraping the algae from rocks or plants. Uh, piscivores have uh, large jaws with pointed teeth that help them catching fish. And so we, they are just some examples of uh, typical morphological adaptations. Now the question is, and I already uh, said that uh, there are many replicates of uh, these um, trophic kills. And then the question is, is this through common descent or convergent evolution? Uh, and I have this slide to illustrate it. So you see here uh, that you have molluscivores in four of the most important lakes in the Lake Victoria region. You also have algae scrapers, you also have insectivores, and you also have piscivores. And these are just four groups that we picked out. So how did they originate? Are all molluscivores related to each other, and then we are talking about common descent, or did they originate individually in each of these lakes? And then we are talking about convergent evolution. 
So that's actually at the basis of the PhD project of Nathan. So he's doing various approaches on these fish. The first one um, is the ecomorphological similarity. So are what we think that are molluscivores, are they also very similar to each other if you look in details? Are all piscivorous species similar to each other if you uh, look at uh, ecomorphological similarity? And yes, they are. This is just a, a kind of simplified um, graph of ecomorphological clusters with the different colors representing the different lakes. And we indeed see that uh, there are uh, the group of algae scrapers here. There's a group of insectivores here. There's a group of molluscivores here. And there's a group of piscivores here. Um, so in reality, and if we take the example of Lake Edward, it's a bit more complicated than this simplified graph. But we do see that the piscivorous cluster together on an ecomorphological analysis, zooplanktivores, pedophages, phytoplanktivores, algae scrapers, molluscivores, and deep water insectivores. But you do see that it's a bit more complicated than the simplified uh, illustration that I just show. Uh, I just want to present you a res results of the Piscivores because decently published, um, and the title was from a pair to a dozen. Um, so we had, on, before Nathan start, started his study, there were only two species known of Lake Edward, um, and these are Mentatus and Scomipinus. That were the only two piscivores, and he discovered that there are actually 12 of them. Um, you have to realize that we are a bit biased if we talk, at least in the aquatic environment, but also in the terrestrial environment, about predators. Because the question was here, where is the predator? Because we always think in, in terms of predators of large voracious creatures, um, you don't have a big predator in Lake Edward. You have 12 highly specialized, highly adapted uh, species with all of them, their tropical niche, and probably they also would have a different micronutrient uh, context. Uh, so we're not talking about one big predator in the lake that regulates the whole ecosystem, but we, we are talking about 12 highly specialized uh, species. Okay, next part is to look at the evolutionary relationships and look at the genomic basis of similarity. Okay, now it gets a bit complicated. Um, why do we take this genomic approach? Uh, well, we had a couple of examples uh, already. The last, the, the, the previous uh, uh, lecture was on just one marker, CO1, which we also use often in uh, the study of, uh, of uh, fish diversity, but it doesn't work with haplochromines. They speciated so recently that you cannot find any trace of distinction of species in CO1 or cytochrome B or any other marker, not even on a combination of markers. So if you really want to go to the species level um, on the genetic part, you need to do whole genome sequence analysis. So that's why we opted for that. There's just no other way. Um, so I have to state at the meantime that also the morphological species are very different. An expert can easily distinguish the species while there's no difference in CO1 or cytochrome B or whatsoever. So with the genomic um, approach, 
what we want to end up is a kind of species tree that reflects the phylogeny. Um, but you could also look um, to um, uh, genomic work. You can also look at the individual gene trees. And then ca you can actually look at gene trees that actually correspond to the trophic niche. So that correspond to that ecological, uh, ecomorphological similarity that we have found before. That groups, for example, uh, the piscivores, that groups the um, uh, lobed finned uh, insectivores, that groups the um, molluscivores. And when you find such a gene, you know that it's on the selection uh, for adaptive radiation. And that's uh, a big thing. Um, it's not easy. Um, we're trying to do that uh, with uh, collaboration of some specialists in trying to uh, see what actually triggers what kind of genes are involved in being a molluscivore, in being a piscivore, in being uh, an insectivore. Um, Okay, I have some time. So the second example that I want to give you is um, another PhD student of mine, Helene Matus, who is looking at small barbs. Um, and she specifically chose the title as swimming in the shadow of cichlids because of cichlids being always in forefront of the evolutionary studies on African fish. Uh, we now look at a completely other group, uh, small, maybe insignificant barbs. Um, and if you look at the two different model systems, these are the cichlids, haplochromis, these are anteromis, and we see that they are completely different in biology. Haplochromis mainly in lakes, anteromis mainly in rivers. I spoke already about the specialized adaptive morphologies that we see in those haplochrome and cichlids. Up till now, we don't have any indication of ecomorphological adaptations in anteromias. Very variable color patterns, uh, and actually that's one of the reasons probably why there are so many of them because of sexual selection in those haplochroma and cichlids, but little variation in color pattern in these anteromia species. Um, Haprochromis are highly sexually dimorph and have parental care. We don't have any, as we know now, no apparent reproductive specialization in anteromias. And then you have low genetic divergence, as I already said, of, for example, CO1. You can't really distinguish the species on the basis of CO1. But there's high genetic divergence of CO1 in anteromias. So two opposite systems. Um, so on the basis of that, this, you could conclude that there's little interest to study the diversity of anteromias. They are just dull species. Uh, but it's not like that. Um, we are now studying anteromias in a couple of areas in Africa. And this was all triggered by uh, another study of another PhD student of mine, um, Eva de Cru, uh, and some other people that were involved on um, the anteromias from northeast, mainly northeast Congo, but we threw in some populations of other areas as well. And we started with four species. So if you would have all these specimens together and you would go to the literature to try to identify them, you would add up with four species. And we already knew they were a bit variable and then just looked at CO1 in this case and we found 23 genetic lineages. And that came as a complete surprise to us and to most of the etiological community uh, on African fish. And on top of that, we could separate them morphologically, but only with multivariate statistics and morphometrics. Uh, you couldn't really have a look at it and say, oh, this is one lineage and I can see this is the other one. 
for most of them it didn't work like that. So little morphological divergence, high genetic divergence. Um, So we started to have a look again in Lake Edward system at Anteromius. And this is actually maybe a very complicated slide um, that shows a bit the different work packages and outcomes in her study. When we start of the unknown diversity, try to make an inventory of the diversity in terms of um, CO1 barcoding, but also morphologically trying to get the phylogeny out of that, also see how the phylogeny contrasts with uh, morphological results. Get a, a phylogeographical framework for Anteromius over various areas in Africa. Um, trying to figure out why there are so many species. Maybe it has to do with hybridization and introgression. There's at this moment hardly a group of fish in Africa that we study in which we don't find signals of hybridization of introgression through their evolution. Um, so that's also something we want to study. And we do that also with the whole genomic uh, sequencing approach. And we also look at ecological divergence uh, with stable isotopes, with uh, 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 eco-morphological traits, and we try to, through uh, whole genome sequencing, try to have some input in all these different parts. Um, and this uh, is, is, is one of the results that uh, Helene got uh, on three species, and again, up till now, everybody thought really that there were three species involved. But when we looked at the CO1 trees, uh, we found different groups, up to three, four lineages per species per assumed species. And what's interesting is that there's a recurrent pattern. There's a recurrent pattern of a lineage close to the Lake Edward in uh, low regions and then higher up another species. And we find that for Aplerogramma, for Castini, and also for Pellegrini. So each time a lineage close to the lake environment in the rivers, and then one, let's call it a highland lineage. Um, and then whenever you cross the border into Lake Victoria Basin or Lake Albert Basin, there would be another lineage. Um, and so I specifically say lineage because we're still in doubt whether we should consider them as a species. Yet the genetic divergence, for those who are into barcoding, uh, CO1 divergence, um, is up to four or five percent, which is very large. So, and normally two percent is taken as the split uh, between species. So we have a larger divergence uh, than expected. Um, so we're confronted with something that we have never experienced. Um, lineages that are geographically very close. Uh, we're talking about uh, lineages within a system. They're not really big waterfalls as the example that we, we saw already today between those highland species or lineage, let's say, and the lowland. Um, so they're geographically very close, often in the same river system. Uh, morphologically, also very close, only distinguishable with multivariate statistics. And in contrast to other groups, there are very few indications that the hybridization is important. Yet the genetic diversity or the genetic divergence between the lineages is very large. Um, so I'm afraid I'm raising more questions than giving you some answers. Um, so the evolutionary scenario behind all this is not clear at all. Um, and especially when we realize that according to geologists, um, and I already had 
scientific fight with them for haplochromans, uh, but they, they assumed that uh, the Lake Victoria area was completely dry 15,000 years ago. They also assumed that it, within Lake Victoria, those haplochroman cichlids that I was talking about, the 600, originated in those 15,000 years. And they came from the higher regions, Edward Kivu. Um, yet in this case, we're talking about a difference between lowland lineage and the highland lineage within the same region that's in the order of one to four million years. So how to get all these things together in an evolutionary scenario, we are not there yet. Um, okay, so let me just end with uh, just illustrating that we are also doing other things than studying Lake uh, Edward. Um, the team is involved in many studies in the national parks of uh, the Congo Basin, especially PhD students within a, within a project of a colleague of mine, the Mbisa Congo project. And then also some other types of publications. And I want to end with this. Um, why is it? That's because in the future, we will probably combine within the Fish Base for Africa program our um, biodiversity studies on African freshwater fishes with studies more oriented towards uh, fisheries. And uh, last year in Paris, I presented my kind of personal assessments of the dreadful state of uh, fisheries in inland waters in Africa. And we are moving a bit in that direction. Uh, and, and just to illustrate, uh, this is uh, uh, here in uh, uh, Laban's work. He, Laban is a PhD student of mine from Uganda, who actually was trained by uh, Heine Frozen and published a, a first assessment of uh, the exploited fish species in, in Lake Edward. We recently, with the Fish Base for Africa people, published a kind of identification guide to the clupiforms uh, of uh, inland waters of Africa. And uh, here we were also uh, going a bit into the applied research by looking for hybridization uh, in, within the Lake Edward system between the um, tilapias over there. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, Jos. Any questions? Yeah, Nicola. About aprochromines in Lake Edward, you say that specialists recognize the species. I suppose you are speaking about males. Sorry, I, about? Males, only males, not females. Like in Victoria, where the female of different species are, are very similar, you cannot differentiate them. We can. We, no, no, we can. we can. So, okay. Yeah. It's a nice distinction that you make because first you look indeed to the color pattern. Uh, and you saw when I presented the 10 piscivora species, indeed there were males. They are much easier to distinguish because of the color pattern. But also if they are if you have the, the brownish gray, grays males that do not have that nice color pattern, still, if you take the relevant measurements, you can distinguish them. You, you can distinguish the different species. Okay. Yeah, you can do that. And, and females? Sorry? And females? Yes, females. As well? Yes, yes. Okay. The, the, the dull looking brownish grays females, you can distinguish them. Yeah. Yes, uh, Daniel. I had the impression when I had the impression when uh, when you were um, confronting these two of uh, the barbs and uh, the apochroman that you were talking comparing uh, uh, a recently developed model with an old model that works. In other words, the the barbs have evolved a long time ago, they have stabilized, they are, they have, they are quite optimal for rivers. And because they are, they have been a long time in each rivers and have a long time to evolve. <clears throat> Fine distinction, but not 
because they started a long time ago, they were already well adapted. Whereas the, 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 the Abloco mine is a new invention and it's still under development. I, that, that's how I understand it too. And, and, and this understanding, uh, I don't see a problem. I don't see contradiction. Yeah, well, the contradiction or the problem is that um, what we now see in lineages that are supposed to be separate already a couple of million years ago are now living in an area that was dry 15,000 years ago. So that's the problem that we have. Well, as a biologist, I would say these no. These are rivers. Yep. These are river fish. Yes. The, the, in the, the lake yeah. cannot be gone and they, they would be river maintained. Well, well, according to the geologists, the whole region was completely dry. And, and, and the fish would get a refugee into higher, in the higher areas. And now also directly around Lake Victoria, you find the same phenomenon of different lineages of uh, Anteromias that are supposed to be diverged million years ago. So there is a problem. Surely the, the answer is the geologists are wrong, right? Uh, well, <laughs> as I said, we already, when we published in 2004, our paper on uh, haprochromans and the origin from Lake Kivu, um, we said, yeah, it must be that uh, haprochromans have survived in the Lake Victoria region. And we immediately were attacked by the geologists saying, no, it was completely dry. And actually, it was a friar already who, who talked about that. And yeah, there was, there was in, an internal fight in the scientific community about that. Great, thanks very much, Jos. So a uh, remote talk on next from Fabrice Telecher um, uh, uh, on partnerships. So uh, assessment of, of the why and how aquariums and fish base can work together to improve knowledge and conservation of fish and, and what comes next. Good afternoon, everybody. As you may know, zoo and public aquarium the world welcome over 700 million Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fabrice Tilici. I'm very happy to present the work that we are doing uh, between fish in the past four years now. So as you may know, zoo and public aquarium the world welcome over 700 million people a year. And they have been a shift from exhibiting animals primarily for public enjoyment in the past to more conservation organization whose mission is to inspire and contribute significantly to wildlife conservation. And so zoo and uh, public aquarium can positively impact the conservation attitude and action of the uh, visitors. And also because you have the same species between the commercial trade and public aquarium, Aquaria can also have a leading role in influencing the commercial trade. And also, um, public aquarium are involved in research. And I would say in the last decades, they are willing to uh, reduce the collection of wild uh, specimen in, uh, in nature and to promote a breeding program within the institutions. So if you look at America and uh, Particularly, those uh, zoo and public aquarium that are involved in the association of, of zoo and aquarium hazard, um, they are involved a lot in research, and this association promotes research within their institution and says that they should involve uh, at least three percent of their budget within research activities. And you can see on this graph that they are involved indeed in the in a high number of, of research articles. If you uh, go back to France, where I do live, 
most aquarium are um, grouped together within what they call the Union of Aquarium Curate. There are today, today uh, 29 active members and 11 honorary or associate members, and I'm associate members because I'm not working in a public aquarium. So the main goals of this association is similar, I would say, to those that I described before for ASA. So the first four main goals are to amaze, inform, educate, and increase awareness. And they have six main missions to ensure animal welfare, to ensure the scientific quality of information, help animals in distress, restrict samples in nature, participate to research science, and contribute to the production, to the production of the environment. So as you can see, one of the six missions is clearly to participate to research science. And they're doing a lot of stuff. And I will, I will give you only one example in terms of conservation. They do promote sustainable fisheries, such as the Mr. Goodfish in the north of France. But if we look at research, clearly they're not involved in a lot of uh, scientific articles, not to say uh, research. They do participate in research, but the, the, that does not result in uh, publication, as you can see on this graph, as France is clearly very few in terms of publication. So the basic idea is how can we promote uh, research within public aquarium and more important, make the knowledge that they do acquire uh, more available uh, for uh, scientists. So we can sum up science like that. We do produce data, whatever they are. We gather data, we, we try to publish them in peer review articles, in reports and books, and then from that, Fishbase will take those data and put them in a, in a format so that people can uh, use them for other articles. So the basic idea is that we do, are con we are convinced that it's really too hard, and I will not go in details for the reason why, uh, to publish articles. So the basic idea is that Let's say that they have a lot of uh, good data within public aquarium, and how can we put them on, in fish base? So basically, this is the idea that we are trying to develop in the past four years. So the first thing is that we have to review what's within public aquarium and whether they are willing to share this, uh, this data with fish base. So we started by uh, an overview of what colleagues are doing in the public aquarium. So first of all, they do know fish bass, you will not be surprised, and they do use it a lot. And we had a colleague, Murray, that uh, make a presentation, I will talk in this presentation. So clearly, when I, I, I spoke to them four years ago, they said, yeah, we know fish bass and sea life bass, no problem. They also, they also already use uh, public um, fish bass as QR cards close to uh, some fish tanks. So clearly, they do use and recognize the, 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 the knowledge within uh, fish space as well. We make an, 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 a survey with uh, three students and we ask different questions and the results are, yes, there were 18 colleagues working in public aquarium that agreed to collaborate with this project, give some time, share pictures, share a list of species, share a minimum of data and we will see what kind of data we could have. And more important, I thought that we clearly need one person within which public aquarium will be in charge of that. So what we call a fish base representative within each institution. So what will be the task of the fish base representative? So it will be to contact fish base. So we will have a list of species, of, of person, sorry, within which each public aquarium so that we know um, with whom we, we should talk. Also, we will be in contact with other fish based representatives so that we have a network and we will develop skill within this network. So we will have to provide an updated list of species and well as uh, pictures, and it might be the easiest actually to do, and also to co collect data and new data uh, within the public. What we do learn also during this survey is that actually French public aquarium do reproduce a lot of species already. They're reproducing close to 100 species. 
among which 33 marine uh, shark fish, uh, three freshwater and a small bronchi species, 32 freshwater teleos fish species, and I put here only a very uh, scarce example of scientific article that has been published by Public Aquarium. Nine marine temperate teleos uh, fish species, and 15 marine tropical teleos fish species. So in other words, they do produce a lot of data because as you can imagine, when you do breed those species, you will have data about eggs, larvae, pictures, feeding, uh, when they do reproduce, in the night, in, 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 the, in the summer, in the winter, whatever. Of course, it's in uh, artificial condition and not in nature. So now we, we get back to fish page. Of course, you do know that page, but with students, we want to go more deeply within fish base to see what's within fish base and how can public aquarium can contribute to uh, to the, the category within a fish. So as you also do know, uh, within the species page, there are 75 categories that you can see on the bottom of my um, of my slide. And when it's in blue, it means that they have some information. And when it's black, it means that there's no information. And I, and we can imagine fish base is a huge puzzles, probably millions of pieces. And the basic idea that would be uh, the role of of public aquarium is to give one small pieces, and especially for species for which uh, the puzzle is almost empty. So this year we have seven students that you can see there, and they work for about four months on this project. And one of their work is that they discuss with uh, fish, uh, uh, public aquarium uh, curators whether they do agree to share their list of species. So seven of them agree, agree. So overall, we have 851 species within this uh, list Excel file. So you will find uh, two thirds of the species in only one aquarium, which means that they can, if they do provide data, it's really important because for two thirds of the aquarium, they are the only one that can produce those data. And 18 species only in five aquariums. In other words, it means that public aquarium, okay, do share some species, but actually they all have their uh, unique species. So after that, they look at uh, what is known for those 851 species in terms of conservation status, information of fish base, and they select seven categories. So when it's green, it means that there are a lot of data uh, today in fish base, and when it's red here, it means that there's not a lot of data. So I hate to put tables on on, uh, on presentation, but just to um, make you understand what they have done. So on the left, one to five is the number of of uh, knowledge that we do have. One, it means that we know close to nothing for those species, and five, it means that fish base actually hosts a lot of data. And the conservation study is from uh, not evaluate and E up to extinct in the world. So they've done that for uh, 851 species. And I put in, in red, you know, they have a lot of information, they, not information, but they have, uh, they host, uh, I would say close to 70 uh, species that are endangered. So the basic idea now is, okay, we do know that fish base has some information for some species and for others, no information. And we do know that public aquarium have host some species. So the question is, can we have a, a strategy to make sure that the data that are produced are really important or uh, worthwhile for uh, fish base? Let's say that for uh, one species, we have already 10 uh, articles saying the, the egg diameter. What is the interest of producing another uh, article or information on that? Um, so that was the basic uh, thinking behind what I'm going to say now. So for me, what would be the most important right now is to focus on the species that are endangered and not known uh, in fish base. 
so that we could provide new information for those that are working uh, in conservation, for instance. And as you can see, there's only one tenth of the species, whatever the statues, that we could consider that are pretty well known in fish base. In other words, and you will not be surprised by that, but many, many no idea of the biology, ecology, whatever you want. So clearly what this table and what this work present is that public aquarium in France and I would say in anywhere in the world can provide unique uh, uh, original data that could be shared from fish base. The choice of species will really depends on the public aquarium. We cannot, you know, oblige people to do something. But I would say that the choice of species should be focused first on endangered of unknown and traits would be a compromise of unknown and also the possibility to get the data, uh, good data in public aquarium uh, conditions. It will for sure uh, need to develop the knowledge, skills and ability to rear uh, species. So there are thousands of data that could be produced. I will just give you here a few examples. The easiest for me is that when you have um, reproduction within fish tanks in public aquarium, you can get eggs and larvae. So basically that would be the most uh, straightforward uh, data that could be obtained. And I give you only an example here from uh, uh, colleagues, not in France, in Austria. So all these data, eggs, larvae, development pictures, and so on, could be useful and then on the field for our colleagues working on ecology. But it could also work, and we are developing with colleagues a comparative biology uh, a method, sorry, to do comparative biology of early life stages. And we do need a lot of data. And actually, there's no data in the here. In, in, so this would be a, a way of producing a lot of data. In other words, it can be very applied or much more uh, pure science. And one example that uh, Daniel uh, Pauli and his colleagues have developed already is um, using what, uh, what is in the Natural uh, History Museum, so museum specimen, to get length-width uh, relationship. So I already gave that to colleagues. So they will work on, um, for instance, dead fish, uh, so that they, we can have some inform, basic information that and we can produce for uh, many, many species uh, some uh, uh, relationship uh, like that, left and with. This is clearly, what I'm presenting here is clearly not really uh, hard, I would say, for a uh, public aquarium to do. So we have, and thanks for all the people involved in fish base, first update of, of, of the page in 20 years. We have also upload, uh, uploaded uh, uh, more than 200 pictures online. And for some pictures, the picture that you can see here was, you know, it was a, in a box, I would say, for a, a decade. Um. Yeah, I'd, I'd just um, call it that one to, to a halt because Fabrice is actually on online, I think. And so I'd like to have the opportunity for him to answer any questions if there are um, in the room because we're running out of time. It's almost half past and we just have one more uh, presentation to get through. So I wondered if anyone had any, um, any questions for Fabrice while he's, I think he's online with us. Yeah. Can you hear me? Go ahead then. Ask Fabrice what is occlusion where because because uh, it's uh, end was aborted. Or, or he can choose. I can play play the rest of the video. Apologies. Uh, yes, you can play, please. <laughs> okay. Can you hear carry me? On, yeah, carry yeah, on. Yeah.
Okay, we've made it worse now because we're wasting time waiting for the video to play. Okay, no worries. I, I think the issue is in the sound booth. They can't actually hear what we're saying. Just to, to fill the space, we'll take a quick photo outside the lobby once, um, once we finish the final talk after this one. So don't dash off anywhere. For who, who remains, we'll take a quick pick outside with the banner. We have also uploaded more than 200 pictures online. And for some pictures, the picture that you can see here was, you know, it was a wooden box and it was more uh, uh, encased. So rather than being a box and not be used, it's now online and it's on the front page of Twitter. So that's really cool. can also have uh, uh, so we do consider that it's a win-win situation. Uh, the implication of the fish-based representative will be very important. If they do not do the work within public, uh, uh, within Aquam, it will not work. And of course. Of course, they will have dedicated research focus in aquarium institutional support. So directors should consider that this um, project are really important and willing to put some uh, personnel and perhaps some money on it. So, and also in fish base, because it's going to be huge work uh, to get the, the data, the pictures, and make sure that everything is, is okay, we'll uh, ne uh, need dedicated personnel in fish base. But I do consider that the beginning of something perhaps new and stronger collaboration among Aquarium within uh, France. And we can see that in the past years now, they're, they're discussing much more than uh, they did by the past. Academia, but honestly, there are not a lot of many people working on those questions and perhaps hobbies, but I would say in the second time. So the basic idea is to promote more organized systematic and collaboration. So thank you again. Um, if you have any question, of course, I'm open to, to them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fabrice. Apologies for the disruption and then technical issues. Uh, we have one question online uh, from Hassan from Somalia, who was asking, uh, do you have plans to continue the, the project? I presume that means with the, the students and the direct involvement. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I don't know what you miss. Actually, I missed a couple of slides. Sorry for that. Uh, yes, we do. We, we will continue. So uh, I'm in charge of a diploma in France, and I work with all public aquarium. So for the next five years, uh, what I'm presenting here will be in the courses. So in the basic courses. So I will do about 30 hours now within our diploma about this project so that not only a couple of students will be involved each year, but all the students, so about 20. And I uh, will make this presentation also uh, next month at the International Aquarium Congress. And the idea is to have more and more aquarium uh, willing to participate. Fantastic. That's great. Um, good to hear. <laughs> Double thumbs up from Daniel. <laughs> I can see you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so um, last but not least, um, again, live and in person. Thanks, Fabrice. Uh, Thank you. David Davies from Ag Unity. Uh, it's also, this is a, a sort of project of ours. We've been in discussion of ways to um, provide some sustainable financing for fish base and research that, that uh, 
produces data that of use uh, for fish base and sea life base. So welcome, David. Thanks for coming. Over to you. So hi, everyone. I'm David Davies, and I'm the founder of Ag Unity. And just as a quick background, what we do is we take simple low cost smartphones and we adapt them for some of the very lowest income farmers in the most remote regions of the world. Uh, so all these farmers you see here in Ethiopia, we've enabled them to increase their income, be able to access a marketplace, education, and a whole lot more. And what we do is really simple. We, we take phones and we just make them do the things that a very low income farmer who's probably never had a phone before, has low, low literacy, work, lives in an area without communication. We change the whole phone so it works in that way. And we've been doing this all over the world for about six years now. We've had multiple successful projects, a lot of them in coffee and cocoa where we get really good results. In cocoa, we've many times increased the whole village's income by two to three times in a single season by reducing waste and inefficiency. And that's life-changing to the whole community. And we've done one project in fish and we came to meet Alex and, and World Fish because we've been dealing with cigar a fair bit and we're hoping to do more in the fish community. Um, there was one problem that we couldn't solve and this sort of leads to, to what I'm getting at. Late la about middle of last year, we created a digital token system called Agriet and that's to solve a very particular problem. We can increase farmers income by fixing their inefficiency. But there's a big problem. When you buy a commodity like coffee or cocoa, vanilla, tea from a developed market, a very, very small fraction of that actually gets back to the farmer. And I suspect a lot similar in the fishing industry as, as well. We've seen it with sea cucumbers and a few other species we've looked at. So we created a digital token that allows the coffee company or the consumer to pass a bit of that, bit of that back directly to the farmers. And we've got two communities of farmers in Ethiopia and Papua New Guinea that are already using those tokens. And quite interestingly, particularly the New Guinea com community automatically started using it as a currency to trade amongst themselves. So they were getting it from people drinking coffee and then they were trading it for someone else to buy fish or using it in the store. So it was quite interesting to see how quickly they caught on to that. So Ag Unity has a pretty strong background in um, crypto, NFTs and other things. And we've been looking at that in deep, very deeply. And when we discovered the World Fish database, we thought that there's a really unique opportunity here because you can imagine what it would be like to be the global custodian of the great white shark. What would someone pay to be that? The clownfish. The blue, what would a sushi shop pay to be the custodian of the bluefin tuna? NFTs and the cryptocurrency provide a, quite an interesting opportunity to involve people in a specific role in conservation. I'm going to wind this back a little bit. So I, much to my shame, I used to work in investment banking before I did Ag Unity. In fact, what we do with Ag Unity helping development farmers is kind of my penance for working in banking because like at Goldman and Lehman, I, I, I learned actually more at Standard Chart, I learned a lot about what is really bad in the, in the finance industry. And in the aftermath of the GFC, Crypto came about with a particular mission. If anyone read the original Satoshi writings, crypto was about looking at the fundamental problems in the global banking system, the central banking system and the way that banks essentially consolidated wealth to those that already have it. Crypto was meant to be a way of demarcating that. But then what's happened to me has been quite disappointing. Crypto has become the monster that it sought to replace. It's become all about internal finance and people hoarding it and getting more money and speculating on these things and making new currency so they can make more. But that's how it's being used. That's not what it was intended for originally. It was intended originally to break that cycle, to say we can attribute value to something like the data on marine species, give everyone their own part in that. You've got 34,000 species of fish here. What if everyone owned a bit, paid a little bit every year to update the, the database? There's more than enough then to take that off the funding. So we've created a little bit of a model around, around this and we put it out to some investors and we got incredible results right away. 
we had an investor in Australia that's already an investor in Ag Unity just say in a 20 minute conversation, yeah, I'll put up a quarter of a million dollars to get this thing started. Um, then we're finding other foundations and things think this is a really good idea. And what I think it is, what we're trying to do is use crypto for that intention that it was meant to before to change a system, to create a funding model. So let's break this down a little bit more. For anyone that's not aware, an NFT is a single unique entity. There can only be one. So if we were to create an NFT for say, to make you the custodian, not the owner, because we know the data's free, data's public domain, but you become the custodian, you become the one person that owns the shark or the clownfish tuna. You're then the person, no one else can have that. So if that's a unique species or a very highly valuable species, it could be worth a lot of money. I'm sure everyone that's heard of NFTs knows that some of them sold in hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. And that's for a photo of a stupid monkey. It's not for something real. This is something that could be perpetual. So what I think we're doing here is NFTs have been doing these silly things like crypto has been doing. Now we're giving it a real purpose. This is the reason that these things should exist. So you could own the NFT. Then what does that mean you can do? So I've got the NFT of the great white shark. And I know there's people with great videos of great white sharks out there. I'm going to encourage them to put their information on fish days because that means that my NFT of the great white shark becomes more and more valuable. So we've not only encouraged people to support this venture, we've now got people who are actually going to participate in helping it because they've got a financial motivation to do so. We can collect some money from the original sale of the NFTs that goes towards creating a foundation to fund the World Fish Organization so we don't have to go out funding it all the time. And we've created a model for doing this for others. Then something becomes really exciting. We know of another organization identifying new species and they created a somewhat similar system with a game around it. That company raised $10 million of investment from Epic Games, which is one of the big gaming companies. Because all the gaming companies now are looking at the metaverse. For anyone that's not familiar, the metaverse is this virtual world that uh, Mark Zuckerberg likes to go on about. It's not there yet, but eventually everyone knows that that's a really interesting space. What if we had metaverses for marine ecosystems? Games where you had to put species in and, and nurture them, like we see in old games like Sims and Metaverse, but they will develop, they'll become big. The reason Epic Games invested in that company is because they know that that data is the gold. Anyone can build a game, but whoever's got the data will have the rich environment that will attract people to it. So now I'm my kid's playing a game, he's building his little marine environment, and his marine environment's starting to get sick. He needs to introduce a shark to that or introduce another, predator, another species. He has to go to the person that's got the NFT and say, hey, can I put your fish in my environment? So now that person with the NFT has got a way of making some money or some tokens or credit in the game in order to do this. That's why there's big opportunities around that. So we're um, promoting this vision and we're looking to um, adapt that to hopefully provide a solid and perpetual funding foundation for World Fish. And if we do that right, it can become a model for funding a whole lot of other conservation. I think this may be the first step in many more. Since we're short of time, I might cut it off and go straight to questions because hopefully I've inspired a few. Thanks, David. Yeah, I'm sure we do have questions. Uh, Daniel. You are very familiar with non-fungible token, but most people here are not. Yep. So please give a definition. What is a non-fungible token? So a non-functional token is something that's derived from a cryptocurrency. Hopefully, every, you know, it's been around for a while. Everyone understands cryptocurrencies are pretty much like any other currency. Just instead of being created by the government, they're created by a group of people and we attribute value to them. Actually very similar to the way we attribute value to a currency. Australian dollars are only worth money because I trust the Australian government. And if I trust Bitcoin or Ethereum, that attributes value to Bitcoin. Now, NFT is a special sort of currency. It's like if you, if the Australian Mint made a special edition $5 coin, 
that had a unique serial number and there was only one of those or only a specific number of those. NFTs are just like that. And so if we were to create NFTs for each of the 34,000 species of, of fish in Fishbase and then link those NFTs back to the data on Fishbase, it's not altering Fishbase in any way. Like hopefully as part of this, we get funding so we can give Fishbase a big upgrade and make it a little bit easier easy to access and a bit better to deep link from a technical element. But that NFT is then the unique sort of key to say that I've got that means no one else in the world can say they're their the custodian of that database. Now at the moment, NFTs have been used for quite mostly silly things. Like you can buy the first picture of something or someone scanned the constitution or put it up and it's sold for a lot of money. I don't think those are real uses. And I often analogize where the crypto industry is now to having like a teenage son who's awesome at sport and super intelligent and he spends all his time in his room playing computer games. Crypto is still finding its way. I don't think it's got the real meaning yet because it's still doing things to make money and to sort of be crypto. I think the evolution, and this is what the original intent was, is to flip that around. Crypto is for a purpose, but the purpose comes first. The purpose should be to get a big group of thousands of people supporting and funding towards an, a genuine initiative. And then because we all care about the information of fish, that's what attributes value to the NFTs and the tokens. Great, thanks. Uh, just going online, Reiner's got, uh, Reiner, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yes, so uh, I, I, I very like the way you, you, you think, and we, we probably naively uh, ventured in that direction, um, I guess 10 years ago, when we offered sponsorships for individual species. So someone could sponsor a, a species and then they could put a small logo on the species page in the upper right corner that would link to their own interests. And um, I, I at the time thought that would be a big thing, but honestly, we only attracted, I think, less than 100 people who did that for small amounts of money. And while it was nice, it did not help us that much. We need about half a million per year to keep fish base going. And we struggle every year to get this relatively small amount of money. Uh, so I like your way of thinking. You're much better in, into this than us naive uh, scientists who have no clue about the real world. We think about fish and graphs and uh, correlations, but not really understand people well, as one can see. So please, I, I think you should talk to Jessica. She had a similar proposal of many small donors helping us to get the money to get fish bits going in perpetually without us scientists trying to raise money every year. And we are not good at it, I tell you. We just scrape by um, and someone else should take over and do better than we. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer. I was actually speaking to Jessica at lunch on exactly this topic um, and with, with quite some fascination. I think what the difference is, and I, I think this is important, if you, if you create a real meaningful purpose around the NFTs, so they're, 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 they're important, you're doing two things. You're addressing the people that care about marine life, which is your audience, but you're also contributing, connecting to this wider crypto community who has roughly $2 trillion of money that they're not, to, not sure what to do with. And it's, it's recently gained money. There's a lot of funds there. And a lot of the NFT projects have raised incredible amounts of money on stupid things, like legitimately stupid things. This is a good thing. So this is a really great potential. I'm not gonna say it's work. And you know, again, this is not Ag Unity's deal. Like we, we're doing our thing, helping lift farmers out of poverty. And we're really, really happy doing this. But when I saw this opportunity, I thought, here's a place that we can play the middleman in this because we can bridge the two worlds. We understand enough about the crypto world. We've got really good connections in there. We've got people that have raised millions of dollars in that circle already that know exactly what to do. And we also span the philanthropic world. We can talk to you people and say, like, we know what's important and we can sort of taper that. So our Unity's only role in this is sort of as the, the deal maker in the middle of the process. And so far, it seems to be working real well. We've brought an incredible legal team, an incredible front team, a, um, a funder. We've brought a technical team that's done multiple games and projects before, and we've got the access into the organizations that have the path. So I'm certainly 
extremely confident at the moment that this could be the pathway that just alleviates fish bases funding need for the rest of it for forever. I have a concern. Um, I think uh, Deng was oh, it? Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I, I have a concern. Yeah. Uh, and it's not to be destructive, but this is a really uh, concern. Concerns are good. The people, people contribute to fish base because they know that we're not making money us. They, they contribute freely because the database is available free hmm. to everybody. That is, has been the condition. And there has been lots of uh, suggestions that we monetize, that we commercialize, that were well meaning to help us, but that would have killed us right away because then people can contribute. The, for example, the French Aquaria will not contribute. Now, how, how, how is the danger that we get associated with what I would like to call a shady world of, mm. of crypto? Crypto is, is used by gang. Not only, but... Uh, they, I, would, they, I would contest that point, but... Well, crooks. <laughs> no, I, crooks. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, used uh, by, they, it's used for nefarious purposes. Yeah, that's right. Po possibly I, more for political donations said, than gangsters, said. but... Yeah, it, it's... But for lots of nefarious purposes, yeah. it's also associated with an enormous footprint, a carbon footprint, uh, but because of the mining. So there is a, a, a negative aspect of crypto. And yeah. what I'm afraid of is the notion that our, our collaborators will think that we or, or, or somebody associated with us is making money with it. Absolutely. I completely agree with your point. Um, there's some there's some countermeasures on the crypto thing. So firstly, you now have crypto um, frameworks that are actually carbon negative or neutral. So that's that's a completely debunked fallacy. There's a, there's quite a few things that come up in the crypto world that are just not true anymore. One is the carbon footprint and things, and also the you know it's used by gangsters. It's used by politicians way more than gangsters. Um, really, really. The, Aren't they the oh, same thing? <laughs> Very good point, <laughs> um, but it's, it, crypto is a terrible thing to use to buy illegal goods because it's traceable. You're much better to use cash. Um, so there's a few debunked, like there's a few things that are just misnomers in the crypto world, but we'll just leave those aside. I think the most important thing to your point is don't merge the two. I think there's the fish-based world, which is the database. And then there is the NFT world around the people that are the custodians that are contributing to it. And that's a separate organization. It's arm's length. It's contributing money to that. But other than that, it's a separate, completely isolated thing. And that, that one, you want to keep that like Chinese wall between the two. Make sure the money's flowing, but don't overthink. Then we don't put anything at fish base at risk. Because again, I, I completely understand where you come from. It's the same with my business. We, when we did the digital token to help reward farmers, because we're dealing with coffee companies and potential misuses, we set it up as a completely separate arm length foundation. We spent well over a quarter of a million dollars doing it, and then we gave it over to completely different people. It's got no, I've got no control over what we do around our digital currency, and the same thing should happen. There shouldn't be any involvement. I, mean, I would recommend that there isn't any involvement for fish base. It just becomes another way that we fund fish base. It's just uh, Jessica, and then we've got a question online for you. So first of all, I want to thank Alex for um, making the connection between things that he's involved with you and World Fish, and then uh, the needs of fish base. And this is a really uh, interesting opportunity that we need to think carefully about. But I'm very I'm thankful for that. But I want to actually ask you about your phones. So the phones that you give out to the farmers, are you able to use recycled, like use old phones that get repurposed for this, that we're dealing with e-waste issues as well, or is it not that um, easy to use them? We, we, we tried them, but that, that's really not overly cost effective. My understanding now is the, the best environmental bank is in, recycle the components. An interesting thing came from Ethiopia um, when we did our first project there. We, we surveyed the farmers who are really like our farmers in Ethiopia are amongst the lowest income in the world. 
we surveyed them on what they thought was a good phone and they came up with, we gave them quite a few choices right from a, a $20 phone up to this one, which is a fully waterproof military grade phone, completely indestructible. Uh, they cost about 50 US dollars in bulk out of China. Um, so we, that's what the farmers preferred. They don't want higher model, but they want a very, very good phone. And the problem with recycled phones is you get really old, old phones and even the people in developing communities don't want them. And then you bring yourself with other problems in that um, Android phones have very different operating systems and features. And in order to make them work in non-communication environments, you have to alter the, we, we actually change the operating system quite a bit on our phones. And in order to make them work, you have to have a fairly standardized model. We've done it on multiple models, but it takes us a few weeks work every time we do a new model. And so we've looked at this in detail and we find the best way is to just go with bulk purchase phones. I really wish you could get good cost-effective phones anywhere other than China, but they've, they totally dominate the market. The, the next best phones, there, there are a few others made in other countries, but they get all the componentry from China and they put them together in that country. There's really nothing made um, that isn't out of China. So that's where phones are. The other thing, and, and this is important to one of our other projects is, um, the phones actually, when you get them out of the box, they do an incredible amount of comms back to China all the time. We clean all that off, but when you buy a phone out of the box, you wouldn't believe the amount of stuff it's telling, I don't know who, but there's continual, that particular model, as soon as you take the operated, the existing stuff off it and all the traceware, the battery life goes up from about three days to seven days. Um, that's how much they're communicating back. So one of the things we're very happy of is we don't have all our farmers being spied on, or um, which which has really amazing geopolitical influences. Like we were in Kenya when the the last election got got swung there, um, and the Facebook influence on the people in the community where we were was inciting actual violence. You could see it straight away. We saw the same thing happening in Papua New Guinea. So I think people don't fully understand the depth of um, information spread on mobile phone and things like Facebook and TikTok and stuff like that are very, very dangerous, particularly if people know who they're targeting and why. Um, so having privacy on the phones should be a very serious concern for everyone. Sorry, that's completely off topic, but, but fascinating. Since, since we All mentioned the, same, the phone yeah. and I got to throw my phone off the stage, which yeah, I love doing. Very dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so really just for the know. sake of the, the consortium, um, David's going to be here all of tomorrow. So we'll actually come in and chat with the consortium about some of this stuff. Um, this, the last question from online, it might be kind of a fun one to answer. Um, is there a way to control who owns the NFTs? How about implementation, piracy, et cetera? How do, how do we control that not a single entity, let's say Elon Musk owns all the unique species in Indonesia? <laughs> Uh, look, one of the interesting things that like we need to create a plan for how they're released and they go out via sort of an auction system. And if look, if Elon, Elon Musk buys them and everyone tries to outbid him and he ends up funding World Fish for $100 million because everyone else has bumped up his price, then would you really care? <laughs> um, objective, Joan. I, I don't look, I don't believe that's going to happen. It's not what's happened before. And there's ways to sort of limit the impact of people buying them up. But I would expect things like, you know, you can imagine a big sushi chain in Japan playing out in Auden, you know, King's Ransom for a tuna and things like that. Cause it's a, so you will get some of that commercialization, but you know, again, I come from banking, right? It, there's lots of bad that goes on the world. You can't always stop it. If you can redirect some of it for good, that might be the best outcome we can hope to achieve. Thanks again, David. That wraps up uh, the session. And I'd just like to say thanks everyone for attending both online and in person. Uh, it's been great. It's been a fascinating couple of days. Um, the Fish Base Consortium will continue to meet for a few more days this week. Um, and it will be announced where next year's is. Thanks very much for attending, especially from local institutions, universities here in Malaysia. And I hope that some new collaborations have emerged from the symposium. Thank you, everybody.